Um, yeah, yeah, but, but we're hearing it here, right? It's coming through still? Yeah, it's coming. Not now. It's not coming anymore. Okay.
actually seems to uh, fit very well with what you folks are doing here. And I think over the next two days, it'll be a wonderful example of creating the next in the field of music technology. I hope you have a very enjoyable and interesting, stimulating conference over the next two days. And I also wanted to acknowledge and thank Jason Freeman for the hard work he did putting this conference together that made it possible for you all to be here. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, I, I need to say a few more thank yous before we get started this morning. Uh, this conference would not have been possible without some support uh, from the College of Architecture uh, and their research symposium fund, uh, and also from two uh, wonderful industry sponsors, Dolby and Mozilla. Um, Dolby has a table out in the rotunda uh, where you can learn more about their uh, audio encoding technologies and, and how they work on the web and with web audio uh, throughout the conference. And both of our industry sponsors are doing uh, sessions on Wednesday during the tutorial sessions. Um, so you can look in your program um, to see the, the, the Mozilla and, and Dolby sessions, and I encourage you to check those out as well. Um, I also really want to thank the entire conference committee, um, and I want to acknowledge them here. Um, uh, my co-chairs, uh, Matthew Paradis from the BBC, uh, Alexander Lurch from uh, the School of Music at Georgia Tech, um, Anna Chambeau uh, from Georgia Tech, uh, Gerard Roma from University of Surrey, uh, Ben Taylor from Goucher College, uh, Takahiko Chuya from uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, Norbert Schnell and Samuel Goldschmidt from IRCOM, who were also the chairs of the conference last year and had the idea of starting the Web Audio Conference in the first place. Um, Leslie Bennett from the Center for Music Technology, who's out at the registration table, who's done a, a marvelous job of coordinating all the logistics with us. Um, and you see all these cameras through here. Um, these are all courtesy of a streaming media a seminar that my colleague Chris Moore is teaching this semester, bringing us uh, live on the web for the whole conference uh, and also archiving all these videos for the future as well. Um, so Chris Moore is somewhere in the building and Mike Winters, one of our PhD students, is, is coordinating things as well as back there. Um, uh, so thank you all. Um, you've all done a, a wonderful job uh, putting this conference together. Uh, and now I want to introduce uh, Matthew Paradis, uh, who's going to say a few words uh, about our keynote speaker this morning. Thank you, Jason. Great to see everybody here. Um, so our first uh, presentation and first keynote for WAC 16 um, is by Frank Melchior. Uh, Frank was previously a senior engineer at the Fraunhofer Institute um, and CTO of ISONO, and he's now uh, the audio research lead at BBC Research and Development, um, where he's currently spearheading the, the BBC's research into object-based broadcasting of audio. Uh, so, Frank, would you like to come up? Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for having me. I'm absolutely excited to be here and to see the uh, second Web Audio conference actually happening, because it's so important what's going on here. And <clears throat> yeah, I'm really grateful and happy to be here and to share a little bit from our perspective uh, of your work, because so much is changing. And in the broadcast industry, I think we, we see changes which are, yeah, changes have been there all the time, but this time the pace is quite different and for a big institution the pace is a challenge and it needs a vibrant research community to keep up with this pace and yeah, that's good to see this actually happening. And I was thinking, yeah, just to illustrate this pace uh, a little bit and look at the BBC internet uh, offer. If you look at this number, so in, in 1994 there were about a thousand websites where the BBC Networking Club, that's why this weird URL comes from, 
was one of the first thousand, and there were 2,000 members and 750,000 hits per week. So that changed quite drastically when we look at the numbers for the Olympics, for example. So in 2012, the year of the London Olympics, we had 106 million requests for video just across the BBC online portal, and we had 37 million browser access the sport, BBC Sport offer on the web during the games. So this gives an indication of the pace of change, and that is also one of the reasons, looking at those numbers, why the BBC actually is turning into yeah, an organization which may will put internet first going forward. At least this is a perspective we from R&D have to this. And to start with, I would like to let my colleague Alex Rawcliffe give you a little bit of perspective on what we are doing to actually make this happen. In the 21st century, we live in a truly interconnected world with internet protocol at its heart. And as this world has emerged, it's impacting on everything, including broadcast. Internet protocol, or as it's commonly known, IP, is now at the center of discussions about the future of broadcast. The potential impact on how audiences interact with content will be revolutionary, and IP sits at the heart of it. Four years ago, motivated by the question, what does broadcasting mean in the internet age? BBC Research and Development began building a new broadcasting system with IP at the core of content production. Today, I'm standing in the IP Studio Gallery, which we've built to enable the new broadcasting system. We treat production as a set of objects of content which we can adapt to fit any environment. We can deliver these objects along with a recipe for assembling them over the internet tailored to our audience's requirements. And we can scale this for millions of users. IP Studio is operationally flexible and efficient, allowing a gallery to be set up wherever is most convenient for the production. But it's not just the production that is affected by this new IP broadcasting environment. Our audiences will also benefit. And I think this is one of the key elements, really. It's, for us, of course, it's all about the audience and what we can deliver them as a new form of content, of new, for, new experiences for them. So this is at the heart of all these kind of discussions. Of course, there's a lot of technology change going on underneath and so on, but it's all driven by actually the proposition for the audience. And that will be one main area which I would like to share what we have done so far with you uh, to show you how important actually the web audio work really is for us because ultimately it might be that the web browser will be the telly or the radio of the future or it may already is so therefore <clears throat> it's absolutely important but before we go there i want to give a little bit more perspective on what alex said about the thing called ip studio <clears throat> and the basic idea behind this really is that we get rid of all this specific infrastructure because you can imagine as a broadcaster we have you know, a very specific setup and a lot of specific hardware, software, cabling and so on and that makes us very inflexible or very slow in adapting and trying out new things and so on. Um, and also there's a big cost factor involved in this as well. So the first thing you could think of is bring this all to uh, a network-based world to the point where you get the microphone and have the network connector at the end of the microphone at the camera and go directly into the network. So this is very beneficial in terms of infrastructure, costs maybe, simplifies things to a certain degree. On the other side, and that is, you know, to be honest, that is hop happening in the industry in the moment anyway. There are a lot of efforts uh, going in this direction, replacing the infrastructure, but there's a key point here where we may have a slightly different perspective than what you already can buy off the shelf. And that is, what can you actually do if you get rid of the concept of the traditional broadcasting infrastructure, of centralized routing systems, of this kind of things, what can you do if you think about a broadcast plant 
as a network. And I think this is, this is the key aspect for us. And this is, again, where we can unlock new experience for the audience using this new technology. And the most important thing for us here is the concept of object-based broadcasting or object-based audio. So, as Alex said, the idea is that if you're in a network, you can have your assets and your single elements of the content floating around in the network together with the recipe or the metadata which describe how you put them together into a program. And that unlocks a massive potential for new experience for the audience. Of course, you can still produce a kind of singular linear output, and I'm not saying that these will go away in the near future. We still will have live television, radio, and, and DVB, and DAB, and so on and so forth. But the innovation will happen elsewhere. The innovation will happen in the web browser, I guess. And what we could do there is we can make the content much more dynamic, much more responsive. And what I mean by this is really taking into account where is the listener? Where, is, where are our audience? What are they doing? What are they using to consume our content? What are their interests? What is their environment in this particular moment? And how can we make the best possible experience for them in this particular moment? And how can we adapt the content that it stays the best possible experience if they move elsewhere, if they change a device, or if you just turn the screen upside down? Um, so this is what is behind responsive or dynamic content. I will give examples of this to illustrate it a, a little bit. The other route, possibly, is that we give our audience a possibility to explore the content in a different way. So other than just consuming what is there, what has been produced for them, give them the opportunity to let their kind of interest, their curiosity guide them through the offer uh, for them and let them explore. Give them interactive features. And maybe also let them become co-creators by taking their content, their production into the process as well. So this is what we see under object-based broadcasting. And now I want to dive a little bit into this and, and give you the examples we have done. And that is mainly really to encourage and to show, because all of these examples I will demonstrate running in a web browser. And I think that's, that's the key thing here. And the very first one, maybe some of you have been in, in the process or in, in this kind of research community since the times of MPEG-4, and they may will get this kind of thing of the weather presenter. So what this is, is a demonstrator for object-based broadcasting, as we did it. And this is a website, and the website has the weather forecast. But of course, every single element of this forecast is delivered independently. So we have the presenter with a uh, green screen. The keying is done in the web browser. And then we, of course, can change the presenter, for example, to a sign language presenter, depending on the preference, on the needs of our audience. Or we can introduce subtitles on top of it, or we can modify the background image so that it's, you know, the area of interest comes uh, in there. And imagine this running on your mobile phone and there's no need to, you know, shrink the video and have a video just as if somebody turns the mobile phone from this perspective to that perspective. You can adapt the whole content that it still fits and gives you a great experience. And this is maybe also one of the key driving forces for, for our effort here, and that is accessibility. So make stuff available to all of the audience to the best, in the best possible way so that they all can really get the best possible experience. And another simple example, a similar lines, uh, an audio only example in this case, something we did a while back, is a football broadcast. And this was delivered on a website with a couple of screens, uh, streams. And the idea essentially is that you give the audience the choice of the crowd so they can move this virtual microphone there to the home or the away fence, depending on what they like, who they want to be with. And then more importantly, they can change the level of the background where there's a foreground. And this thing was highly successful. So we trialed it with about three to 4,000 listeners. 
and we get extreme positive response. And we could also see that people really were engaging with this website as we were tracking what they were doing there. And interestingly, regarding the uh, balance between foreground and background, about one third was really happy with our broadcast mix, so the kind of the neutral position, which is good news. But about one third put it all the way up to you know, more commentary, and another third about put it all the way down to have less commentary, which is a bit interesting. Uh, we weren't expecting quite that. But, you know, this is what the audience like, so why not giving them the opportunity to adjust things as, as they want? And of course, you can also, this is still quite techy, I would say. So you may just have a setting in the future where you say, okay, I want to have an increased speech intelligibility, and this is just happening in the background for every piece of content which is coming to your device. You're not, no need to bother with any slider for a new broadcast or things like this. Um, so it's really, and that is, a, that is an interesting aspect. It's really understanding what the audience like and how far you would, would go with this. And if you go one step further and introduce interaction, then Again, you can apply a different thinking to developments in the industry as they happen in the moment. Um, and interaction here, in mind, it not necessarily has to go all the way to game-like experience. We're still broadcasting, we're still telling stories and creating stories. So there is an area in between where interaction is there, but it's maybe not a game what we have. So an example for this is a thing called Venue Explorer. And the concept behind this is that we have all these wonderful Ultra HD video streams becoming available now. And now you can think, okay, everybody should go and buy a new telly, get the more pixels at home. So this is one perspective of things. And having a network-based system may be helpful to do the scalability. But you can think about this also a little bit different. You can think about this and imagine people still have their normal resolution or consuming content over the tablet or the mobile device. So what can you do with this kind of high, res high resolution picture? What you can do is you can give the audience the possibility to navigate in this picture. And if you do this in this kind of stadium setting here, for example, then you can also explain what is going on where in the stadium. So you can have some overlays telling you what is happening where, presenting you maybe also with some results for this specific. And this all works with audio as well, of course, on top of it. So what actually is happening in this example is if you zoom into the tracks, then you get the commentary for the track and you get to see what is actually going on there and get, get to hear what's going on there. And if you zoom into the long jump, then <coughs> you get this perspective or you zoom out and you get just the stadium atmosphere. And it gives you an idea how that actually works in an athletic stadium during the games, for example. We also try this for other forms of content. So what we did is we used it in a theater setting where we had to track actors on the stage so we could have these virtual cameras following um, the different actors. And also we will try this in a, in a more musical setting as well. So this is an idea how interaction can look like without playing a game uh, out of the stories we want to tell. So this was all kind of playing around with the different streams or kind of a layered thinking or playing around with the resolution which is available. But if you truly think object-based, you can go even one step further because you can start to take the time dimension apart. And that might lead to even further new experience for the audience. And it's important to keep in mind that, of course, there is still live television and people watching certain events live, and they will do in the future. But there's also a, a massive chunk of the audience who really consume our content on demand. They decide when they want to watch it, and they decide how much time is available to them. And that unlocks the old concept of the schedule, and therefore, you can try to start to break the kind of the boundaries of the content. So there are reasons why there is a certain documentary format which just have half an hour because it fits into a certain point in the schedule and will come there every week. But if you produce this content, then you may have to throw away quite a bit of content because you just have half an hour. Or if you at home 
like for example want to consume this uh, radio documentary we have here, you get their half hour podcast, but you may just have 20 minutes to watch it. So why not introducing a simple, simple slider which gives you 15 minutes or 30 minutes of this program? And I think the beauty of this is it looks really simple from the audience perspective and it solves a real problem. I'm commuting and just have 22 minutes. I can't listen to the 30 minute podcast. So do I lose the interesting bit in the middle? Do I directly jump to the end? Do I play it faster? That all doesn't make sense. What makes sense is have the content arranged in a graph and offer a trajectory through this graph which fits the time being available and bringing in some details if you have more time and taking away some details but still keep the story arc if you have less time available to you. And I think this is, this is where object based now really comes into play. And of course underneath from our end uh, it's, it's quite a challenge to be honest. However, what it gives you for free basically is due to the fact that we have the different elements not only layered but also chunked up into certain time fragments, you get these features which I described earlier almost for free. You can adjust the level of speed, you can adjust the level of the background of this content, of course. <clears throat> but then underneath, that is where the real interesting stuff happens. And that is where we actually pull the information out of our very skilled editorial people. Because they have to tell us what is the most important part of a story and what is the relationship between the story elements. And this is a graph which is actually underneath, so the other thing was only a visualization for our audience. So you have these themes, and under the themes you have the narrative objects, and then underneath those you have the audio objects which actually are the pieces of content and the pieces of recording. And then you have the dependencies, and that is the important bit. You know if I have introduced this bit here, then I have only these three options to go further. If I ask this question, then I have to provide at least one answer. If I have a lot of time, I may have a long answer. If I have only a short amount of time, I just go with a short answer. And I think this is really where it needs to go, and this is where it gives benefits to our audience. And as I said, audience really at the heart of what we are doing, and Another element which is actually at my heart as well, because I've worked in this field for quite a while, is immersive audio. And what we at times do is we just take our audience and make uh, little experiments with them. Someone there? It's just the wind. There is no wind. Can't you feel it? It's in the very walls. Listen. Until the end. That wasn't me! You will be consumed by the loss. Creepy. Creepy. It's really creepy. Again. Kind of skin crawly. Tense. Original and enjoyable. I'm pretty scared. I was on the edge of terror for most of it. There were bits of sound that gave me proper goosebumps, like the screams and then the pauses. It's a pleasantly unpleasant experience. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we do. We put our audience in a crypt and then see what happens. Um, <clears throat> not quite like that. So this was actually a program which was uh, produced for Halloween last year. And these were two full-length spinal radio dramas which were available over the iPlayer. And what you just saw were pictures from uh, the um, launch event of these uh, two programs, actually. So we invited our audience to get the full scariness uh, sitting there and listen in the dark over headphones to this spinal program. And they loved it. And we have, we have quite some effort going into uh, immersive audio, especially immersive audio over headphones. And while this was produced as a static binaural soundtrack, which was available as an alternative option in iPlayer, 
We are also very, very much looking into what we can do on a more dynamic side in the web browser, and I will give you some examples of this uh, in a minute. But again, it's about listening where our audience are, and our audience are listening quite a bit over our radio content over headphones. So it's about one third of the adult populations who listens to radio over headphone. And that is a massive number. And that is how we actually can get immersive audio out there because we meet our audience where they are and we not think, oh, you have to buy this fancy thing and that fancy thing and we have no idea how that actually works and translate from the production environment into uh, the home environment having 20 speakers there. They all have already the headphones. I know it's not as easy as that, um, and there's still quite a lot of question how you do personalization or uh, individualization on that, and we have, yeah, we're doing quite a lot of research in this field, how to get binaural audio into uncontrolled environment. But we have to, because that's where our audience are. And, of course, this was radio drama, this was pure audio, but binaural audio is also beneficial in, in other areas, of course. And, for example, we're exploring, yeah, again, the interactive bit again, and very nicely it fits into what you might can do in the field of natural history unit programs. So, we did a trial um, looking into the combination of interaction and true 360 sound, and this is the introduction to it, just to give you an idea how that looks like for the audience. You are about to be immersed in the sounds of the rainforest. Wear your headphones to experience true 360 degree binaural audio. Watch our guide to show you how to interact. You will be able to move from left to right, Press and hold, drag and drop, and tap multiple items. You can also share this experience with your friends and pause the footage at any time. So this again was an experience also present provided in the web browser, but it leads to something else. And what you see here is a screenshot of an actual 360 video which we also combined with the um, binaural audio. And I think that's where it's in the moment is a lot of interest and a lot of buzz and a lot of momentum. So we almost get a weekly request, well, can we do this kind of trial for that kind of program? And what can we do about the audio? And how can we move this, this forward away from stereo? And I have to say, at some, for some programs, it, you do not necessarily have to go there. But for other programs, like sitting in the middle of the jungle uh, and things like this, it's really beneficial to have these capabilities. And I think we really, really need more possibilities there on the rendering side to individualize the HRTFs, for example, and to really have more control on what's going on on the rendering side. But the platform, the browser, this is the key platform. And of course, we're also taking it further and look into what you can do with virtual reality and, yeah, explore this space as well. There's quite some momentum there as well. But we do not have to forget that we cannot expect in a very near future that a mass audience will have all the de devices necessary to experience this. I think there will be still a big audience which have a different setting. So what we are interested in is how can we create something which scales itself all the way from like a latest Hive or Oculus Rift or whatever you have it to the web browser again. And one thing we, we were doing there is um, actually based on a research project. So we, did a, we are still doing a research project into 3D audio with three universities as part of the BBC Audio Research Partnership. And we have produced small scenes which should demonstrate 3D, 3D audio because there's also always a kind of a, yeah, some bounds if you really want to do things in production. You have limits in, in budget and so on. So we wanted to take away these limits at least for one minute and then see what we could do. So we have created those scenes, and then it developed some momentum internally because people were so amazed by the binaural sound that they decided, oh, can we, can we put a visualization on top? So it's almost the other way around, and can we do a binaural VR experience on top of this? Uh, and it has went quite, quite a way, and I will play you the trailer, 
but I can tell you that this project or this uh, program will be premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival next week. It happened in the autumn forest, where the trees constantly shed copper-coloured leaves and there's always a chill in the air. Amelia and I loved it there. It was heaven for our eight-year-old selves. Miles and miles of space to run around. Trees so tall and wide that we could chase each other and never be found. Except one day. So more to come on this one, uh, and possibly also becoming available uh, to the audience at some point. And I've been talking quite a bit about the audience, and there's one more thing which I want to add here before I have a, have a quick look at the production side of things as well. And that is a question, how do we get, actually get stuff in front of the audience? You've seen some examples which we presented on the R&D website, so BBC R&D, which is quite a niche, then we have seen some examples which are all the way and underneath the big brands of the BBC. So for example, the Halloween, the Fright Night stuff that was part of the Radio 4 offer, so quite a big thing. And there's an interesting space in between because obviously we want to try these things out. We want to hear what the audience say and what they like, what they don't like, because that is our driver. If they don't like it or don't need it, why should we do it? And why should we take it all the way to the big brands and, and make it a, a standard of effort, uh, offer if we don't you know, have verified it before? And we need something in between which is not all the way to the R&D website, which is you know, very interesting for you guys, but not for the majority of the audience looking into this. So we have created a platform for this, and here is a quick introduction what this platform does. Take a peek at something new from the BBC. Taster is your chance to sample the latest experimental ideas and see which ones you enjoy the most. From interactive mashups to stories that go deeper. You control what you watch and do. All ideas on Taster are fresh and new. Some might be a bit ahead of their time while others might be right on time. Great ideas can come from anywhere. Who knows why some fly while others don't? That's where you come in. As you try out new ideas on Taster, you'll get the chance to rate them. We'd love to know what you think and feel free to share your favourites with friends so that they can have their say too. Who knows? You could be the first to spot the next big thing. BBC Taster. Something new is starting, and it starts with you. So this idea, there's a landing page there, and that is where we put all the technology innovations uh, under this brand, but also program innovations or new editorial forms or experiments or, or little gimmicks and, and this kind of stuff. It's all under this umbrella, but again, it's a website, what else should it be? And people can try things out and then can easily rate things and by that we get an idea what they like and also they can share things on social media, again, gives us direct feedback what they like and what they don't like. So, as I, as I said at the beginning, everything is driven from the audience side of things. However, we also look into the production uh, side and I have one example here which I would like to share with you because, again, it's a browser-based tool and there are quite a few of those uh, within the organization. Um, but I think this is very interesting because of two things. Because it shows how you can improve the situation today by introducing this new piece of technology, but also unlock the potential of the future going <laughs> forward. So, this is a project called Discourse. And this is in the moment in the process of becoming a BBC product by what it means a product to be available to all our editorial stuff. 
and that might not you, to you, but that was really exciting for our editorial people because it is essentially an editor, an audio video editor, which is based on the transcript of the program. Russell Brand, who are you to edit a political magazine? Well, I suppose like a person who's been politely asked by an attractive woman. I don't know what the typical criteria is. So you can directly edit in, in the transcript. Russell um, Brand, who are you to edit a political magazine? I don't know what the typical criteria is. I don't know many people that edit political magazines. Boris, he used to do one, didn't he? And the way it works, people upload their content. The uh, processing is done in the background. And then you have this editing interface. And then you can export it again so that you can do some, some tweaking and fine tuning in your workstation. Or alternatively, you may just get the file uh, at the end. And what is so interesting about this is that this mirrors the process which actually is going on in the production, in the editing of interviews, for example. So things are transcribed. People work in Word documents to analyze how they want to put together their program. And then they go back to the audio editor and try to find the bits and pieces they have just decided that should go in the program. And that is quite a time-consuming process. But they like to work, though, uh, because that gives them the best possible quality. So we, we took this into account and thought, OK, how can we streamline this? And we did some user stu studies on this as well. And it turned out that we can double the speed of the production of a typical interview by this piece of technology. And that is why they are so amazed about it and why they like it. And here's, here's the result, just exported. Russell Brand, who are you to edit a political magazine? A woman. I don't know what the typical criteria is. I don't know many people that edit political magazines. Boris, he used to... So that could go in an editor and can be used further. But there's another element to it, and I think that's, that's even more exciting. And that is they are happy producing the programs as they are because we have introduced something which speeds up their process. And there's so much pressure into this production process that it's really, really helpful for them. But at the same time, we now have an almost perfect transcript of the program, which just comes on top of it which not much additional effort from the, from the user. So they, they might correct a word here and there. Um, so I now start thinking what you can do with this if this transcript is flowing through your IP-based production plan all the way to the listener. So you can have a full text search in your radio program. Or you can go much further than that. You can cross-link things and so on and so forth. And that's why, why I'm quite excited about this project, because it shows how you can do innovation in a very, very nice way. You can just introduce this new piece of technology, help the people in the process right now, but then unlock something for the future. I think that's, that's quite important. And as I said, this is a, becoming a product now. So it's taken from R&D to uh, the support side uh, within the BBC in engineering to make this available to and scale this up, essentially, to our editorial stuff. But of course, we are already thinking about the next generation. And I have a fresh out of the lab video here from my colleague Chris, who uh, gives you a preview of the next generation of this tool. What I'm going to do is show you a prototype of a paper editing system that can edit audio and video content uh, using paper. So here is a screen, uh, which is an online interface where you can upload audio and video recordings. And they're automatically transcribed. So here's one I made earlier. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. So what I'm going to do is press print in here. So I'll press print, and then very shortly, it'll come out of this printer. So here we have our transcripts of the audio recording I just showed you. And if you come over here, what we're going to do is make an edit uh, using this digital pen, which has a small camera in the end. And what I'm going to do is uh, cross out December tour in Yorkshire, like that. And I'm going to underline the word Christmas. So now I'm going to dock the pen in its holder over here. 
And what that does is it uploads the changes to the server. And so when I go to open the file in here, it has already made the edits uh, to the transcript. So if I press play. In the course of it, I rode for a long distance in. So you can see that it's removed December tour in Yorkshire, and it's also bolded Christmas to highlight that. So. <laughs> That's Chris, and that is actually his PhD project as well. Um, so this has really been inspired by what we got as a feedback, because this reflects the process which is actually happening. People would like to sit there and just do their edits on paper, mark the things they like, cross out the things they don't like, and why not taking them from there rather than enforcing something on top of them? So this is. And we will see how it goes. So this is very early stages now for this next generation, and that is, again, in the R&D space and in the BBC product space. However, um, I think it also shows nicely what inspirations if you get uh, if you talk to the users of your tools. And of course, on the production side, there's a lot of more to do, and there's already a lot of more stuff available. Uh, Alex was mentioned that at the beginning, uh, standing in this gallery actually means there are kind of vision mixer fun functionalities, audio mixer functionalities, available as part of the IP studio. And essentially all what we are doing in R&D will more or less use IP studio as a platform to demonstrate how this works and how a new end-to-end -end IP based broadcasting system would look like and what we expect to be offered from the industry um, to us to use such a system. And I hope I also have given you a little bit of an idea what is already there, and as I, I can't repeat it often enough, it's so great what is coming out of this community, because all this work is, is really relying on this. We have to make it work in the web browser, and we have to make it work in the different web browser, uh, and we have to scale it up, and that's the only way we can do this. Um, we cannot support each and every single device, we cannot write thousands of different apps and different versions. This is a platform to go and you are the people who drive the platform forward, which is great. Um, I'd like to almost conclude um, with a video showing you a little bit, some ideas where that may can go. And this is, sorry, this is not real, this is just a thought. Are you a mum, both me and dad? We're definitely going to get more. All right then, game on. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in the woods. It's sunny, but really cold. We saw squirrels, blue tits, magpies. It's been really good fun. There you go. Submitted. That's so cool. Are we winners? No, I can't. Are I'm we? not going to be winners. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not going to accept that. We haven't been beaten, surely. No, we have. Oh, look, you can see what other people have seen today as well. Look. Just oh, keep wow. looking through. Are we were there. I think that is a lot. Oh, really good idea. Oh, look. <laughs> Take a video. Nice. <laughs> Excellent camera work. Very good. <laughs> Meteorologists and astronomers predict that the loss of Mumbai from its current orbit will affect. Oh yes. Um, Mum, Dad, please can you help me do some homework? Yeah, yeah of course we can. Group project, space race. Thank you.
combustion engines, and as they don't need external material to form their jet, they can perform in a vacuum and are used to propel spacecraft. How are you getting on? Have you finished yet? Yeah, finished. Excellent work. Um, Dad, please, please, can we go here? I think we can manage that. So you may have your own opinion where the future might go and how it will look like uh, and what the web browser will look like in the future. Um, here's my take on it. I think, and that is really, really important to me and really at my heart, in the end, technology doesn't matter. I think what matters in the end really is the story you tell, the people you meet, and the experience you share with those people. And having said that, I hope you have a fantastic two and a half days here in Atlanta to meet people, to share experience, and just move the web audio stuff to the next level. Thank you. So in this example, this was kind of a real island prototype thing. So we haven't used any of those because we really want to try to get the user experience that was driven from a user perspective. And we, ha we are in the moment in the phase of exploring how that could look like as a scalable production tool. So we have some other programs we are investigating. Uh, how we can scale this up and make this as a production tool. So what happened for this one was essentially uh, putting software engineers, editorial people, uh, sound designers into a room for two weeks and make the thing happen. Uh, taking an existing program, taking it apart, strowing the different elements in the graph and then go from there. Because it was really driven by the user research, how can we present this uh, to the user? What you just mentioned may will come in in a later stage uh, in the moment, we are not there yet. Um, we have another project which is un under similar lines, more in the, in the world of news, uh, where we do similar things, where we can do editing of, of short news snippets uh, and make scalability in time there so that they can 
put together in a way that that fits in, in a certain schedule. But this, I think, is the next level. Uh, we are not at that stage yet with this work. Is there any more questions? This one in the front here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was really struck by the, uh, when, when you showed the idea of a, of a documentary with a scalable time mm -hmm. uh, scale, uh, it seems like um, there's a potential for a lot of convergence between the, the way that you would offer audio for interactive experiences like a video game or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking particularly about the music aspect of that. Is that something that you've explicitly thought about and maybe how video game music techniques could be then applied to linear media to make it scalable? Mm -hmm. Or uh, I'm curious what you think about the convergence of those uh, worlds. Yeah, this is a big topic in R&D, this conversion of those two worlds and, and also this kind of 360 experience, <laughs> VR experience, they, they bring those two worlds really together. In this particular example, we hadn't any, done any clever stuff with the music. We're just you know, editing then in a way that we could have loops which were running because there were some other features which I haven't mentioned. For example, you could pause the content and what would happen is the, and that is very similar to a kind of a game-like uh, environment. You, so you pause the content, the narration will stop, but the background music will continue, the atmosphere will continue, you go away, make your cup of tea, and if you come back, you're still in the same mood, and then the narration uh, goes on. Um, we have, in, as part of the BBC Auto Research pro, um, Partnership, we do a big research program with uh, three other universities uh, called the FAST Project, and we look into dynamic music objects as well there, so where we you know, investigate what can be done on the music side to have music which actually fits into the time which is available of the user slides, uh, use this slider, then it deducts the music as well. Um, but yeah, we haven't got that far yet with this prototype, we just used very simple things. But of course, that was on the table and we looked into the, also some, uh, for example, the, the generative nature of some of the game music stuff uh, would become quite handy in, in, in this example. Absolutely, yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I know recently the BBC launched the new music app. And did you mm -hmm. have any involvement in that from an R&D side? Can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Um, we weren't directly involved. I mean, R&D was involved, but not our group, uh, to be honest. Is there anything specific you'd you like to know? I'm happy to talk after as well, but is, what is, what, what's the burning question? I guess I just uh, wanted to know whether there was any kind of particular uh, transformative aspect to it that was coming from the R&D side, but it sounds like maybe not. It, it's maybe just a new way to box up content for people. Yeah, I think I think the aspect which is new for the audience <clears throat> is taking into account their history of listening and what they like and, and this kind of aspects. But this is all, you know, established stuff in terms of <clears throat> research and development, I would say, and that is more productizing something which is already there. However, there is something where some of this works is really feeding in, in a you know important scale, and that is the responsive radio stuff. Actually, is is part of the proposals which were made by the BBC in the charter process, where we say, okay, this is how radio may can look in the future, where we can just remove certain bits of the schedule, replace it by what people might like um, or prefer, <clears throat> but also having this kind of scalable lengths, variable lengths aspects in this. This is something where the R&D stuff really feeds into the high profile strategic work, but the music app is more taking what is there. It might be in the future, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would see potential for, uh, like you can customize that radio program, mm -hmm. giving the user simple ways to customize their own you know, audio tracks that they've yep. got in their space. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, as far as um, HRTFs and um, binaural sound, do you see things going forward being um, using a, a sort of a standard HRTF for all listeners? or 
somehow being able to generate an individual HRTF for each individual listener? And if so, how would that how would that happen? Mm -hmm. like that's the burning question for surround audio yeah. and, and head tracking. Yeah. You could talk about that as well. Yeah. Uh, I agree. That is a burning question, and that is one of the areas where we, this and the aspect, okay, on which kind of resolution is useful, or what kind of kind of maybe intermediate format you would need to represent this content, because you don't cannot render the full blown object based uh, stuff in the, in the browser, for example. So, my take on this, and this is my personal view, is. Um, most importantly, is you need a high quality HRTF to start with, and there, there's good stuff out there. Uh, equalization plays a really important role there, uh, good low end and all this stuff, and, and that is where quite often uh, publicly open available stuff is, is suffering, but it's getting better. I believe that by introducing head tracking, you can make a massive step forward in terms of the shortcomings of a non-individualized HRTF, actually. And that is what we are looking into first. And if you look at the market, what's becoming available in terms of headphones and, and stuff being driven from the VR side again, this is no longer a technology challenge at all. It's just a matter of getting those products uh, out there. So I think, and we, we used, uh, we made some demonstrators where you could have head tracking plus browser-based rendering. So that's something we did last year or the, even the year before. So that is a possibility. Um, we are also working quite closely with our colleagues from Radio France, for example, who also are quite deeply involved into binary research and produce binary programs. Um, they are focusing a little bit more on the individualization side of things. And what, is, uh, what I've seen so far there is that you may go with certain groups of HRTFs or uh, kind of meta level where you're saying, okay, you have a choice of seven and you try to represent the population by this kind of uh, limited set of HRTFs. But that, of course, introduces the challenge of how do you get your audience to pick one to pick the right one and not get bored by any kind of settings? Can you do it via a game? And how effective is the whole thing? So I think for me, high quality HRTS is the first thing you need to do, then you introduce tracking and then you add the individualization bit. That would be my kind of personal view on the order of things to you know, get the most out of what is available. Ultimately or ideally you need all of those but you know, we might have to go step by step there. But the initial quality is crucial, and we found this. We quite often have this problem that we have certain programs, we render this with our own, own rendering system, and then we render it elsewhere, and there are not the same HRTFs involved, and that leads to massive compromises. And so having flexibility there, I would say, is, is an important aspect of they uh, as well. Really good question, really important point there. We can cut afterwards. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Fran. The, the, Thank you. The future of audio looks, looks very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a slight change to the schedule now. We're going to have a half hour uh, coffee break. Uh, the next session is moderated by Michael Boother. Could you, could you stand up for me? Okay. Could, any presenters in the next session, could you make sure you catch up with Michael uh, before your session uh, to organize getting set up and, and timings and things? Once again, thank cool. you. Cool, thank you. Also, uh, Pastor Walker is presenting today. Can you spend some time uh, during the coffee break?
Thank you.
In a few minutes, I invite you also to our performance tomorrow night's concert, which is related to this paper uh, called Crosstown Traffic version 2.0, and uh, you're all involved with it. It'll be fun. Uh, the proceedings for all of the papers for the conference are now online, and so the URL is there. Anyone who wants to look at our specific paper for more details, it is there. This project's inspired by Musique Concrète, and also it's in response to some of the pieces we saw last year in performance, WAC 2015. Our history goes back a long way, including a piece we collaborated on in 1996, Crosstown Traffic, now retroactively uh, 1.0, uh, and we're interested in the social technical interactions of this whole aspect, not just the technical ones. Uh, we're both uh, composers, performers, in addition to our other 
guises. The Musique Concrete approach is for the found objects for our project is a series of uh, audio files for Hammond B3 organ that Bill composed and recorded and also sound files on viola, my instrument which I composed and recorded. For uh, sonic unity, we decided to structure the pitched elements into a uh, stacked D7 sharp 9 chord to give some harmonic unity as they're uh, modified. Sounds like this. Where are you? Yeah. Uh, that chord and also our composition title is a, a personal homage to uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, it's one of his big chords. Um, the composition is structured in a 10-minute arc, ABA form, uh, loosely uh, referencing a classical sonata form. And this is designed to give large-scale unity across multiple performances. Tomorrow night's concert is a second performance of this piece. We performed it in California a few months ago. And despite all the differences on the small scale, it'll retain this unity over the large scale. Which is kind of nice. The uh, audio files, we have 16 of them. We've divided them into four sonic groups. Uh, four of them are organ legato sounds. Four of them are viola legato sounds. And let me just give you a sample. This is one of the organ sounds. So they work together harmonically, even though they're completely independent. Yeah, that's fun. So the, the fact that they're completely different sound files, they will always mesh together. One of the organ staccato sounds, which is the third field. Yeah. Oops, let me come back. Don't do that. Where have you gone? Feet don't fail me now. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that about? Come back. Computer, don't let me say what I'm gonna say. We'll get there in a hurry. We'll be there in just a second. Um, there we go. One of the viola staccato sound files, which is me knocking on the body of the viola. Different places on the wood resonance. So we have those four different fields. Uh, we have different roles, uh, three different roles in performance. I serve as the conductor. Um, Bill is the principal performer on laptop, and everybody in the audience, you, uh, are the house band using your smartphones or tablets as instruments. In performance, we divide the performers into four performing groups um, identified by color and icon. Um, so that we can signal silently during performance what we're going to be doing. Uh, the red heart group is the viola legato sounds. The blue, the eye, is the organ legato sounds. The green tree, viola staccato, and the yellow leaf, organ staccato. So we have both color-coded and also icon-coded for those who may be color-blinded. And I somewhat raised my hand into that group. In performance, the conductor, because the performance, you don't want me talking because the music's happening, the, performer, uh, the conductor can cue the various, various performance groups with a very handy low-tech uh, sign, which signals that, in this case, the red heart group is about to do something, at which point I cue start and stop, and I have these for each color group. Once a group is performing, the individual performers in that group have a variety of personal options with which to improvise. Can start and stop, as well as choose four different, any of their four files. They can uh, select different playback rates. We have preset playback rates so that they harmonically always fit, and selecting playback rate uh, randomly selects a new rate, which is kind of fun, which of course affects both duration and pitch. And then forward reverse, which is uh, reverse play through the, uh, through the audio file. These three relatively simple permutations, when multiplied by the number of people per performance group, actually provide a very large number of output results. 
It's our hope that the performers within that group, a group uh, use their musical skills to listen to each other and fit in accordingly. Uh, from the music point of view, our performance goals are to have fun. Individual form performers should have fun with the process. Yes, serious music making can and should be fun. With a very high level of performer, performer choice on the small gestural scale, while at the same time retaining large scale aesthetic control. It's always a 10 minute arc, always has an ABA shape. Uh, we cite John Cage with his aesthetic of all inclusiveness as well as very firm structural control as a background for this. And our end result, we hope, is a very musically satisfying performance of a final, of a formal music composition. At this point, I'll turn it over to my colleague Bill to discuss some other aspects. Thanks, Brian. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about what the, the interface is like both, uh, for both kinds of performers. Um, there's a bit.ly URL there if you actually want to go check it out. It um, should be live. Um, and the, the idea is to be really simple and straightforward. So uh, the phone interface there on your right, um, once Brian assigns everyone in the audience in particular sections, you can use those icons on the top to select which section you're in. You get uh, big buttons for each of the sounds that he talked about. Um, and I used a uh, cheap and cheerful CSS animation to flip things around depending on, to show whether they're playing forwards or backwards and also uh, showed the uh, playback right there in text. So that's quite straightforward. Um, the laptop interface is very similar uh, except that it gives me access to all the sounds at once um, and it lets me play as, as, up, up to all of them at the same time. Whereas because of the limitations of the phone speaker we only uh, have one of the sounds playing at once on your phone. So this is the simple interface that we've built um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, how the code is structured. It's all up on, on GitHub. Um, there should be a link in the paper if you want to go check that out. Um, and I want to bring in a few uh, ideas from uh, the other work that I do at Mozilla which is to talk about something that the Chrome developer team and the, the Firefox team are together calling progressive web apps. And really, the question I want you to think about is what could you do if your web audio project really had all the affordances of a native app? And so in particular, I want to focus on just the low friction of getting the experience onto your device and being able to use it afterwards. So uh, what you see here on the left is a very simple JSON specification, which is an app manifest spec that we've got at the W3C. And by adding a meta tag that points to such a file, um, you get a much better experience for your users if they want to add this to their home screen. So here I am looking at the phone interface and I'm going to choose this add to home screen option. And now uh, when I go back to the home screen of my Android phone, I get a nice high res icon which is great. And when I launch it, you see I get a splash screen using that icon and the title I gave. And now the interface is running full screen. So there's no browser nonsense. There's no bookmarks. None of that extraneous stuff that distracts you from the musical experience. It's just the, the, the interface that you designed, right? So you have a very low friction experience. I can give you a bit.ly URL. You go there. If you like it, you can add it to home screen and you've got the whole experience in a nice, smooth, natural way. But wait, there's more. Because um, there's another API that I want you to know about called Service Worker, which is very sophisticated. But one of the things it can do is let you control the uh, caching of network resources. So what I'm going to do here in this demo is I'm going to put my phone in airplane mode, and I'm going to launch a website, which never works. Right? This is a guaranteed disaster guess what, it just works. Because all of the HTML, JavaScript, and sound files for this experience were cached in my service worker. So whether you have bad Wi-Fi or no Wi-Fi, once this thing has been added to the home screen, people can just use it and it just works. So uh, I think these techniques can really be a great synergy with what we're already doing with Web Audio API to make really great experiences that people can rely on and come back to. Uh, so one other, two, two more things I want to cover. First, um, just separation of concerns between the JavaScript code and the, the HTML uh, that creates the interface you saw. 
And I've tried to move as much of the behavior into attributes in the HTML so that I can change the, be the resulting behavior without rewriting the JavaScript code. So here's an example of the HTML for one of those buttons. And by using attributes, I can change which sound file it's using, what the allowed playback rates are, whether that sound is exclusive that causes all the other sounds to stop, um, and so forth. And by that, I can create two HTML files, one for the laptop interface and one for the phone interface, and reuse the same JavaScript. So it's a really nice way to separate those concerns. And you could grab this and put your own sound files in there and make a, uh, a playback UI very quickly. And then one other thing that I sort of uh, stumbled across while getting ready for this is just all the, the standard techniques we use in any website, for example, analytics. So when we did our first performance, uh, I had instrumented all of those button presses with very simple Google Analytics code. And so I can tell you, was anyone participating? Well, I could hear their phones, but I also have numbers, right? So we had 33 people in that audience. Um, this is just a screenshot from Google Analytics. And I can tell you that there were about 7,000 button presses done by those 33 people in those 10 minutes. So yeah, people were actually playing along. And I can drill down in here and figure out which sounds got more play than the other ones did. Um, so that was a pretty neat uh, benefit to using web technology. It's really easy to find out what people are doing. So uh, I think what was really successful from the technology side was splitting out um, sort of configuration data, putting that in the HTML, and leaving the behavior as generically as possible in JavaScript. Um, I really think, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, um, that the browser is now letting us deliver these experiences in a really low friction way. I can't imagine an audience going to the trouble of installing a native app to do this stuff. And then our summary from the music point of view, you know, in the field of music performance, it's a little bizarre in that success is largely a subjective uh, decision. Uh, and so what I'm working with on this is that for success is that the audience performers enjoy what they're doing, which we hope will happen. Uh, and, and, and there's an ease of learning. So before tomorrow night's uh, concert, we have, I have three minutes to rehearse the piece to explain how the game is played, and let's try a trial run, and let's get, get it going. So it needs to be learnable very, very quick, and then a, a real perceived sense from each performer that what the button I'm pushing actually means something to the overall performance, right? I'm actually contributing something worthwhile. Uh, and, and so that's from the performer's uh, point of view. Uh, at the same time, we want to have a musical arc that is a true musical arc, and we hope we uh, maintain that with this 10-minute uh, structured composition that I conduct following a score and a stopwatch, and at the same time having a great deal, maximum amount of flexibility by each user at the small scale. So join us tomorrow night and find out if that's a success or not. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for one or two questions. Yeah. This uh, one behind you. See how this works. I'm just going to pull it out, right? Hi. Um, hi. Hello. Oh. So thank you very much for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, you mentioned that the code is accessible on GitHub. Um, I was wondering, are you thinking about maybe commercializing, commercializing it? Or is it only for performance and do you want people to be able to reproduce it? I think, um, I, I think we offer it freely in the, in the spirit of, of mashups and yeah, other people. I'd love to see other people grab it and mess with it. Um, all the sound files are up there too, by the way. So yeah, it's pretty all out there and uh, yeah. If it's useful, I'd love to hear back from you. Thank you. Other questions? Down here in front. Super cool. Can't wait for the show tomorrow. Thanks. Um, uh, you mentioned the cage a as an influence, but I'm also curious uh, if you've thought about the connections between this and some of the John Zorn game pieces. Because when I see the signs, that's what I think. I think of Cobra or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a number of people looking at it. This goes, you go back to uh, Earl Brown. There's lots of things where, um, you know, the less formalized approach, but it's still formalized, but in a fun way. You know, I mean, ultimately, at the end result is, you know, the, uh, it actually goes back to our, our keynote this morning that it's not about technology, it's about people. And then you go back to, well, technology is simply a set of tools, right? Um, my fork is a tool. So what's the tool that gets the job done easiest? and in the straightest line. And so like very cheesy color signs work and they work really simply. So that's good, you know. So, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of other people have looked at it, that approach. It's, let's not worry about the, the cool factor if it gets the job done, if you will. Thanks. Then it's, then it's very cool if it gets the job done. Right. Yeah, I've got the question myself. Yeah. Uh, you, you, I really love Jimi Hendrix, but he was an inventor. He used effects. He used to uh, to make lots of feedback and so on. So with Web Audio, you've got lots of uh, real-time effects that you can do. Plus, you can use also the motion sensors from the phones. Do you plan to make it more Jimi Hendrix-like craziness in front of the crowd? Uh, We've talked about that because you know there's, there's you know the accelerometers, all this is on there. That's the next step, and which is you know the, you know you start with okay this stuff works, and again in a concert I've got three minutes to make sure everyone knows what we're doing, and you make that as your first test bed. This is going to work, and then yeah there's okay, more next fog. step yeah yeah and, and yeah. fog machines of course that's yeah. important. Got time for another question? The piece being called uh, Music Concrete Choir, I was wondering if you considered sort of the acousmatic reduction like of uh, Pierre Schaeffer um, in choosing the, the sounds that you used uh, for the piece. Well, like in our case, the found sound, you know, Schaeffer would go, you know, like train study. What, what, he's walking around Paris, what can I find? Well, in our case, it's similar. Uh, what can I find? Well, I play viola, Bill plays organ, that's our found. You know, and it's just, and it could be, you know, again, someone else can use it to find it. It could be jet airplanes. It can be anything else. So, yeah, so Schaefer Air is be involved in this, is, of course, from that point of view. But I think also we're a, a little bit at the mercy. I mean, Schaefer also knew, uh, had a little more control, right? We're at the mercy of, of the frequency response of everybody's phone and, and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Thank you. Okay, we still have one minute for questions. We're on schedule. So uh, I understand that you are trying to develop this as a use for the phone, but do you guys look into, are you guys looking to develop this into like a digital audio workstation, like a FL studio and like the Pro Tools because of the MP3 files you use? I think our aims are more modest than that. Really, we're, I, I imagine that folks using this kind of code would prepare the sound files in some other tool like that. This is more about uh, just making it really easy to produce these interfaces that you would use in this kind of performance, yeah. So a fairly narrow scope. But I think Web Audio gives the potential for building those powerful tools in the browser. I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that the rest of the, sh of the conference. Okay. The next questions will be Prior. Yeah. Okay. Thank lot. you very much. So, uh, I need my glasses. So the next presenter is. Uh, Michael Winters, a PhD student at Georgia Tech Institute and uh, Music Technology, and he will present about multimodal web-based dashboards for geolocated real-time monitoring. Thank you. Great. So um, yeah, I'm a second year PhD, and uh, the past two summers I've been working at the Georgia Tech Research Institute with Taka, and we've been exploring sonification projects, largely using web audio only. So uh, traditionally, sonification is something that happens 
on a desktop computer, you have your um, Max MSP Pure Data Super Collider, and you have um, a static data sort. This can also be um, dynamic, but uh, instead, what if we start to do sonification on, on the web, and how would that look like? What would make sense? What sorts of data types can we, can we explore? Um, so that, that's kind of the, the, the focus of this talk, and I'm going to present two, two applications that, we, that we've explored, which are uh, Internet of Things and Smart Cities. And so this is just an image of uh, a future world where everything is connected to the Internet. So your, um, your traffic lights, your refrigerators, uh, your buildings, your, um, your brain, you know, everything's connected to the Internet. And the information is being transferred, and there's just a huge amount of data and um, so the question is, how do, we, how, do we start to parse this, how do we start to parse this data, and how can, we, um, how can we convey it in a really nice and convincing manner to, to users? And so the answer to this are, is colloquially called dashboards. Dashboards kind of basically come to you with some uh, boxes, modules, which have graphs of various kinds. Here's another one. Um, providing information on things like weather, sunlight, like any, any sort of data coming, coming to you um, in, this, in this very, uh, in, in this format. Um, and these are very effective and very convincing and very, very, um, I think aesthetically, can be very aesthetically appealing. But I think there's a lot missing to them. And what's missing, I think, is really um, more, more, more modes for communication. And in this conference, we're interested in audio. And so we're interested in how can we add audio to things like graphs so that you can do things that you can't do with vision alone. So this is, uh, this is the part of the motivation. So um, effectively conveying information with using multiple modes. Um, also, there's a security interest in this. Uh, that's basically one of our, the second app, which is Internet of Things. And um, uh, basically, if, you, if, if the more devices you have on the internet, the more chances you have for security problems. And if, if one device on your network is faulty, that could make actually a really big problem and affect a lot of people. So con conveying this information in a good way is important for security. Um, and also, we want our dashboards to be uh, friendly and, and use usable by a broad audience. So not only specialists who are monitoring networks um, for uh, uh, for, for data purposes, but also the general public. So how can, can, how can we provide information that's useful and relevant to someone who has no um, stake, in, stake in the, uh, the data and just wants to um, experience it? And so there's some pretty uh, um, also important characteristics about this data. First of all is that there's a, there's a lot of it. So we're dealing with a, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of data, a lot of different dimensions, uh, also changing in time. Um, also, diff many different kinds of data, all happening in real time, and uh, this is actually, you know, the sorts of, this is, uh, these are data properties that actually lend themselves somewhat well to sonification. Um, so, what what are, what are the advantages of hearing? Well, um, hearing is eyes free, so you don't actually have to be looking at your screen to be able to hear a sonification and be able to get the information you want. Um, also, sound is a, actually a stronger alert system than visual. You'll react faster, you'll react with more emotion than uh, presented with a visual alert. Um, and then also, you know, aud auditory um, scene analysis and the ability to parse many streams in parallel. These are, these are reasons why um, we, 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 want, we want to use a hearing for, for data. And then also, I think sound has these really nice cultural properties. So for instance, music is a really good example of that. But um, you know the social the social aspects of sound are really important and important for design especially, um, and this is really important for um, engaging the public, um, and for usage and, and sharing and all these things. So basically, consider two two audiences: are specialists and public. Specialists want to m monitor multiple information streams in parallel, um, and often have to balance their attentional resources. So uh, you have a like a visual, you have actually many things you're trying to do at the same time, talk to colleagues, talk to whoever, also monitoring all these sorts of things, tasks. And it'd be really convenient if you didn't have to always be looking at your display. If you could just have this ambient awareness of, of something like security level or, or um, weather or any sorts of data just, just by, just as an ambient sound in the environment. Uh, and this would, I, we would hope this would allow people to discover and resolve issues faster um, than just using visual stuff. 
Um, and also the public is a, a really big audience that we want to um, we want to attract to the display. And so that's another reason to use sound and we hope to, to, to get to um, target that audience. Um, so there actually, from what I've seen, there's not a lot of sonification that's happening using web audio. Um, and web audio is a, is a technology that is developed for the web. And when you are sonifying web-based information, information using web-based technologies that are native to your browser, for instance, um, I, I like to call this web sonification. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting and very inter uh, useful prospect. And uh, I hope that to see more and more um, sorts of applications like this. And again, the desktop environments are Maximus P Pure Data and Super Collider. These are um, very good and very flexible, very powerful tools, um, but they do not um, travel well. They don't travel to your mobile phone very well, and um, uh, so they're, they're, they're limited in that respect. And so for, for sonification on the web, you might consider having something like a web server where you, um, you, you, me you message it and then it, it, it does some advanced sound processing and spits it back to the user. That's, that's too complicated. Let's use web audio. Um, and web audio is, is good, but I think for sonification, it, it's, not, you, it's not enough. Um, it doesn't come with, um, I guess, data, data packaging and data operations that you often use in sonification when you, as part of the mapping process. And um, it also is, uh, I think, for people that are just approaching it, a little bit too, um, a little bit too complex um, for, for what you're interested in doing is sound synthesis and mapping. And uh, I think, from my perspective, the, um, it's a little bit easier to think a little bit more abstractly, which is why I use the, we, we use the um, Data to Music framework. This is actually an API developed by my co-author, Taka, um, who's also going to be presenting on it. And it's an API for sonification on the web. And it's not only, um, so it's sonification has, has data, data operations that you can do. It has um, uh, so built-in modules for, for doing synthesis very easily. It also, uh, basically, it, it, it has musical structures in it that you can, that you can very easily interact with and, um, and use. Um, so th this is actually, it makes it a very nice um, library for sonification. It's probably the best one available for web audio at, at the moment. Um, and Taco, we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. Um, you can play with it, it's, it's live on uh, Heroku, and then you can also use it and, and build, build with it um, on the, on, from using, using GitHub. So our first application was um, Shodan, which is a search engine for devices, and this is kind of a scary thing when you realize how many people use default passwords. <laughs> um, and many people do, and so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a rather, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem, and with this particular search engine, you could do something like search for um, an outdated version of Apache with, with a known security issue, and this is actually something that would be publicly available if you don't, um, if you don't actually do the necessary security steps for your refrigerator or device, and um, someone who's malicious might actually find your device and use your default username and password or, or launch an attack knowing what they know about this particular version of Apache. So it's kind of scary. Um, so I can uh, present to you the, our dashboard for this. So that obviously this is Atlanta. Um, these are new devices that Shodan's finding in real time. And uh, the colors uh, indicate different kinds of services. Um, and this basically displays the publicly available information that you have. Um, and I, I think with, with this map, um, you, can, you might be able to find something that's, um, that's vulnerable. Um, so for instance here, I'm, I'm just kind of like playing around um, you know, this is about 15 minutes, so we're just like going from the start of the day. In 15 minutes, 20 minutes now, all these services have been found. So now, now I'm at Shodan, and uh, what I can do is actually go to this service and check it out myself. Um, it looks pretty secure. Uh, anyways, so. Um, so now there's a lot more activity. 
also the sound environment is different. Thank you. Um, and uh, so basically we have a few different levels of a few different kinds of sounds going on. One is these like one shots that are happening whenever a new, something new enters. Here's a case where someone's not been very good about changing their header. And um, okay, this is... Uh, So anyways, uh, this is uh, after three hours, and uh, the, the, the geolocated part is important here because actually we can go down to the Fulton County Government Center. Um, the capital of Georgia is, is in Atlanta, and uh, this is pretty, um, but there's a lot of, lot of services that are geolocating to this particular point, and even more 13 hours later. Um, so there's a, obviously there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of data here, and you don't want to have to be kind of looking at it the whole time. You need to have an, an environmental awareness of that. Um, and so we think sounds really, really effective here, um, especially the environmental audio, which can tell you something about ambient threat level, um, and also the tempo, which is using the DTM framework, which is kind of like an ambient kind of, uh, uh, yeah, just tempo, and that, that can tell you something about activity level. Um, the second application is smart cities, and this is um, uh, a burgeoning field where you basically are equipping your, your city with all sorts of sensors and trying to make it run more efficiently, run faster. Um, and uh, often a, a trademark of this would be like this sort of sensor box here where you're basically collecting all sorts of data. You attach it to our, another piece of infrastructure, which is like a light post, and you, base, and you just stream, uh, stream data from this particular point. So we made it a second, a second web app, or a second web using, uh, using the DTM framework, and it's a lot more um, graph-based. Um, we're looking at, for instance, uh, amount of traffic in this area, um, and we have five different sort of uh, sensor boxes going. This is something we, we um, uh, I think that one's very, very effective as well. Um, and that was done by Taka uh, in particular. Um, so uh, we haven't had very much, time, very much evaluation. We've done a few public demonstrations and gotten some informal feedback. Um, uh, this is uh, basically convinced us that sound is certainly enhancing the visualization in some respects. Um, it increases engagement. It allows you to, to not look at your display and still get information that you want. Um, and uh, also, it doesn't really seem to require very much explanation, especially when there's a re redundancy between the visual and the auditory cues. Um, so there's like a modality blending um, going on here. Uh, and then Array of Things Project is a, is a big um, organization. And they, they really took the, 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 the act of making this information publicly accessible to heart. And this, um, this basically, our project inter interested them for public outreach. And they've contacted us, and we're continuing this, I think, on a much, much larger scale. I'm not actively involved anymore. I think Lee Lerner, who's a co-author on this paper, will be here on, on Tuesday. And if you want to talk about that, he'll be available. 
So uh, web sonification is something that is very useful for IoT and smart cities, and it certainly as, as time goes on, the number of devices that are connected um, increase. Um, I think we're going to be looking towards other modalities for, um, for information display, and I think sound might be a very effective one for the reasons I've described, like the cultural impact and the ability to, to use um, sound where you're, when your eyes are occupied uh, elsewhere. Um, um, sound increases um, accessibility and public engagement with data. Um, I think that's uh, pretty, very, very strong. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so and DTM, which is the background for all this, um, is a very useful API for web sonification. It's something we've we've made here at the GTCMT. Um, happy, very happy about it, and also looking forward to future development and talking with people and, and making it better. Um, any questions? Thank you. Are there any current new projects you're working with the DTM framework um, uh, beyond these two? Uh, I, I'm not. Um, so the developer Taka is uh, using it a lot and is going to um, live coding demos. If you want to see it in action, talk to him. Um, I, I think it's. I think when, when I was using it, um, you know, on the, on the one hand, web audio was was very kind of technical, and there's a lot of um, just like code that you have to write to get it operational. And DTM, I think, um, at, the, at the moment was not quite. Um, it was a little bit buggy. Uh, but now I think it's a, I think it's a lot stronger um, and uh, um, capable for more projects. F um, flocking, for instance, is another um, environment you might consider for sonification. It's uh, a little bit like Super Collider, but on on the web browser. Uh, it's made for sound synthesis, but it doesn't come with um, data, uh, op basically data operations. So you you'd have to get another library for processing data before you sonify. What you didn't mention is that artification is uh, uh, particularly strong to reveal temporal aspects of your data. What happened to the timing of your data? Oh yeah. Um, so it's it's all unfolding in real time, and I think we, we've captured some of the events through like one-shot sounds or like through through changes. Um, I think. Um, Except for in the last case where we were playing through the data very quickly, the, the, the density that we we're displaying is not so high at the level where you might use something like autification to hear very subtle things that are not immediately available visually. Um, but yeah, that is a, a sort of an unlocked potential there. Okay, I've got a question. Uh, in the very last Web Audio Weekly newsletter sent by Chris Lois that mm -hmm. many of us read, I think, uh, I saw a very inter interesting uh, presentation by a mathematician mm -hmm. that visualized uh, using WebGL and uh, 3D representations uh, the, the, the Fourier transformation. And uh, it was really uh, st uh, strong as a, a tool for visualizing while hearing the music and understanding the data behind. Mm -hmm. That is what the, the Fourier transform transformation does. So uh, did, do you think about more, maybe more 3D-like visualization and maybe what the sound would, would, you, would sound like, mm -hmm. uh, your sonification in, in that case? Uh, because for the moment it's just 2D with a frequency and uh, and uh, and uh, the tonality of the notes and the yeah. the height of the notes. So I don't know if you looked at uh, this sort of representations. Um, uh, so uh, with, with sound, uh, dimensionality is not very well defined. Um, you, you can keep on adding streams and streams and streams and make a very rich and dense auditory auditory scene. And in fact, you don't you're not actually limited by a particular line of of sight, which is which is um, the way that vision is, so you can have sound all around you. Um, uh, I haven't, I haven't <coughs> looked at any 3D graphing environments. Um, 
I, I think that uh, um, you can, uh, with sound, with, with sound, you you might um, be able to display things you wouldn't be able to in a in a three dimensional. Okay, so for the, for the next yeah evolution. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so it, no time left for additional questions. So now it's time for <coughs> let me remember the name for Alo Alik uh, from uh, the Queen Mary London University. Is that, is that right? Oh, University of London. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and he will talk to us about an interactive mood-based music discovery app. See that? So the actually the next three talks will be from Queen Mary. So we'll. I uh, hope to keep entertained with my colleague Florian. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my mood play and the story of how uh, it came about. But first, I'd like to mention I'm a postdoc and I'm working on um, something called FAST that Frank earlier mentioned briefly in his wonderful keynote. Uh, so the project is about um, FAST stands for Fusing Audio and Semantic Technologies um, for uh, Intelligent Music Production and Consumption. <coughs> uh, and the main <coughs> assumption in the project is that if we take semantic web technologies and we combine it with advanced signal processing techniques, then uh, that will lead us to um, user enhanced user experience that also Frank touched upon um, uh, through by developing new products and services. And it applies for both professional and casual users. So the main problem with mood play that, um, or uh, what we're trying to solve is uh, searching or browsing large collections of music, which I'm, um, I assume uh, you all have come across um, as either researchers or uh, consumers of music or composers. And there are ex existing solutions um, that are trying to solve this problem from different points of view, like expert knowledge or crowdsourcing or um, uh, extracting feature-based uh, content-based features. So the mood play, uh, we developed the mood play interactive experience um, last year, and that enabled users to uh, collectively explore um, a data set of music by choosing um, emotions. And the system combines audio and semantic web technologies. And in the system, the, the uh, participants, they can choose degrees of energy and pleasantness. So um, moods are uh, mapped onto a two-dimensional um, coordinate plane. So there is a metric uh, applied to um, uh, emotion space. And then we um, were fortunate enough to exhibit it uh, at two separate events um, where the general public could interact with the system. One was Digital Shoreditch Festival, which is like a te technology festival in London. And the other one was a BBC R&D Sound Now and Next uh, symposium. And I will play you a quick video of the Digital Shoreditch.
So what we also did was um, we wanted to uh, get feedback from users who interacted with the system. So we, we designed a survey. I'm not going to concentrate too much on it, but one of the things that we uh, did was ask uh, sort of um, open questions about uh, what the users would uh, use the system um, and what improvements they would suggest. And then we analyzed the, the responses. And we identified different themes, um, including personalization, where people said they, they would like to apply this search uh, and browse uh, technology to their own collections. Or um, they criticized the visualization of it, because it kind of looked, um, I don't know, uh, seven, from the 70s. Um, or identification, because we didn't um, provide any metadata about the music that was playing. Uh, so that's how the My Mood Play came about, really. Was another problem we uh, wanted to solve was not having to set up an installation every time if we wanted to have users interact with it, but uh, created, recreated in a, a browser-based environment. So um, there are uh, the background of the um, music player. There are different ways that um, a, you know mood has been used as a uh, as a search parameter before. For example, mood cloud um, has used crowdsourced mood tags before. Um, there is a um, online a service mood stream from Getty Images, uh, or for instance, Music Cover is another website that uses emotion uh, as a parameter. But you, uh, for these uh, commercial applications, they don't really know um, how they've created the mood space uh, because they don't really publish their data set or any details about it. So. The mood play is based on an earlier um, technology developed at Queen Mary, which was a mood conductor interactive system that was used in live performances uh, to um, um, encourage the audience to interact with the, the live performers in different settings so to, and to suggest what kind of emotion the performers should be um, uh, representing when they are uh, making music. And then another um, version that we also, uh, it was a very experimental version where we developed um, was called Moodbox at uh, Sonar last year, where we were trying to use biosignals and extract biosignal features to represent um, arousal and valence. Uh, coordinates, uh, which I'm going to get into in a bit. So the data set that we're using uh, comes from I Like Music, uh, and it consists of 10,000 commercial over over 10,000 commercial tracks. And what makes it really work is uh, mapping these track meta metadata to crowdsourced tag statistics from last FM. Uh, and the way it works, I'm going to refer you to um, another paper if you want to know the details of, of how um, the, the mood tag statistics are converted 
uh, to two-dimensional coordinates. So I'm not going to go into this in detail at this point. But so this is one of the uh, visualizations of the uh, ILM10K data set. You have um, each of the dots here represents a track. And um, so in the lower left uh, quadrant, you have negative valence and arousal, which more or less means that um, so arousal is a scale between calm and excited, and um, valence is um, um, from negative to positive. So I'm going to, at this point, really uh, show you a very quick demo. So here is the uh, My Mood Play interface, and I can select a tag on um, So now I'm in the uh, high arousal and low valence, so negative but uh, excited. So now we can try and find something in a space that sounds like a party. And now we have something calm and positive. So these are the four quadrants. So if I go back to... Um, so yeah, so basically the software architecture, we had to rethink it from the, the, the uh, one-way implemented for the installation. So in, because in browser-based environment, all user-facing components will have to be wrapped into the browser, so there is not going to be a projected screen and and the PA system. You have everything in in a single device, and and all the interaction will also have to happen in uh, one space. But um, I quickly want to um, talk about the uh, semantic uh, web technologies that uh, power the system and al allow us to do. Um, uh, yeah, this linking between different data sets. Uh, so what we're using here is we, we use terms from the music ontology to describe the um, track metadata. We are using um, an extension of the um, um, tagging ontology to link the tag statistics to the data set. And then we have our own terms that we've defined for anything that's missing. And then also we're using um, additional metadata from Music Brains uh, services, which is like a, a, a huge online music um, dictionary. Uh, so uh, this is an example Sparkle query that uh, really um, is behind all the interactions in the system that finds the nearest track um, in the data set by Manhattan distance between user input and track coordinates. Um, and the, you see the, uh, the parameters to the query um, are at valence and at arousal are when the query runs are actually floating point values between minus one and one. Uh, so the audio playback, we are using um, Web Audio API, and uh, the which cr so that's uh, what uh, plays back the tracks and crossfades between the tracks. But they also are working on enhancing a facility to choose between multiple tracks in the region and then use content-based audio features 
uh, to make more intelligent decisions about, uh, you know, for smoother uh, user experience and better uh, mixing between tracks. And also, since the, uh, there is an um, unpredictable component to this, we don't know when the user is going to select the next uh, location. So we don't really want to always as, um, uh, load the whole file. So we want to only get uh, chunks of audio at the time to play back um, because we don't know when, whenever we need to mix in the next track. So um, current, the current system does not support collaborative um, music selection, but I don't think that means that it shouldn't. Um, the, um, I can, we can also envision a more sort of a social uh, media platform for mood play where multiple people can interact in the same space at the same time and bring back this collaborative aspect of uh, the mood play, mood play installation um, into also the browser-based application. So uh, for conclusions, so mood play, my mood play, the web browser um, application is built to accommodate user suggestions uh, from the installation version. Um, the architecture in principle is designed more accessible. Uh, it demonstrates the concept of dis distributed digital music objects um, and we are fusing uh, semantic and audio technologies. But the main problem uh, is still that the, the um, mood annotations of how to extend this uh, experiment um, of, um, to, to any music collection, to, to enable um, any music collection to be browsed this way, has not been solved yet. Thank you. Any questions? Greetings. Um, re regarding the annotation, uh, you're, you're saying that there is that problem. Rela if you have a personal collection, you can't get new tags unless you pay in crowd uh, in Amazon. I don't remember the name of the platform. Last FM. No, no. Uh, oh. If you need people to annotate your your collection, that's what I, I'm saying. Oh, but the, it's the the mood play is based on crowdsourced data. So yeah. Last FM. So it's I, I, I was trying to remember the name of the platform in Amazon, but doesn't matter. Uh, you said, yeah. Sorry, that's right. Uh, why don't you, if that's a problem and you have a small data set, won't iterative learning help you in that aspect? Well, we don't, we're not trying to solve it for small data sets. Uh, we're trying to solve it for larger data sets because we all are increasingly um, you know, exposed to more and more, l l larger and larger collections. So. Um, I think in the, the one of the problems in the uh, MIR um, community, uh, music information retrieval community, has been that uh, the algorithms that uh, have been developed over the years have not been really tested on large collections, and and they don't really work if they are applied to larger collections. So that's the problem. Uh, the other question is. In your opinion, how, how did the semantic technologies get you ahead when if, for example, you use it just JSON because you are dealing with browser technologies? How did it so that's a difference between, we can think of it in terms of structured data and data formats. And everybody uh, can um, develop a data format 
and then only they knew, know what it means. But if you use ontological structuring, then hopefully you add some extra meaning to it that is, is, uh, is less ambiguous to somebody else who is trying to use it. Hopefully. Uh, hi. Um, I might be, I might have, may have missed this, so I'm just going to ask you, and if I miss it, and you just tell me <laughs> okay. you missed it. Okay. So um, regarding the, this question is regarding the, the criteria you use to label music into different kind of moods. Mm -hmm. uh, did you take a look at, uh, or would you, I think, what do you think about the literature that, that is related to the psychology of mood regulation? And uh, they're particularly about using music as a mood regulator. I think that might be an interesting place to look about labels. You mean the other way around, where you are trying to regulate somebody's mood? Because here it's more about what choosing a mood that the music represents. Yes, but because of the people choose music to regulate their mood based on, on, on a specific criteria, that might also have like an impact on what they mean to express when they have a particular mood. That's why I'm kind of wondering. So what's your question? If you have considered that option. Uh, I, OK. Um, I guess in some ways, because one, some of the answers, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but it, it, one of the um, responses from the users uh, at the um, digital shortage was to look into how this kind of system could be applied to uh, music therapy. But, um, but we haven't really addressed uh, you know, those topics yet. I don't know if that had anything to do with your question. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thanks. No time left for questions. And stuff. Okay, from the same university, we've got. Uh, uh, computer. Okay, so we've got Florian Talman from the same research group that will talk about a smart mobile player based on ontological structures and analytic analytical feature metadata. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to, everything looks really small and I've noticed that it's quite dark in here, or the screen is quite dark, so I'm not sure if it will be visible, but. I'm just going to start like this. Is it? Yeah, it should be visible. Um, yeah, so my talk is about, comes from the same project that tries to relate uh, semantic concepts with um, audio. And it's about the specific player that we're uh, developing uh, that is meant to be as versatile as possible to uh, play back musical, um, musical content in various, in as many different ways as possible, I guess. Um, so we started by asking ourselves, how do we listen to music today? How has it changed since um, the first mobile music devices came um, onto the market? Um, and I guess we can say that a lot of things have changed. So we can basically have access to any kind of music at any time and anywhere we are when we use streaming services. Or we can also store a great amount of music onto a device. We can um, use, we have uh, really elaborate music recommendation systems um, that are um, enabled by the web, um, I guess, um, and these devices being able to be connected to the web. And then we have music recognition systems and probably some other things that I forget here um, because I, 
uh, yes. But so one of the main things that hasn't really changed in, on a broad scale, I guess, is that is the listening experience itself is that we're still mainly listening to music um, in a linear way, basically. So uh, most music that we listen to, I mean, at least on the level of songs, we still do that. We still listen to a song um, that is playback in, in the same way every time we listen to it and don't really change anything about that. Uh, some things have changed uh, to make uh, music experience less linear, uh, for example, compiling automatic playlists and even spontaneous playlists and things like that and some basic musical adaptation to um, the user's context are now also coming onto the market, I guess. Uh, but still, um, on the level of songs, we are still quite limited with, with what we can do, and this project is about um, uh, investigating this, I guess. And if we look at the devices, we see that they have a huge amount of capabilities. Um, they have an innumerable number of sensors, they have uh, really powerful processors um, and, and uh, basically they are pocket computers that we have. So we could actually do much, much more with the systems that we have. And some uh, musical artists have thought about this. So they're in the last, in the past few, uh, maybe five years, they have been uh, musical applications uh, that were specifically developed for uh, certain artists that uh, really tried to do that, tried to make music less linear. Um, and I guess maybe the foremost example of this is the RJDJ uh, framework, basically, uh, which allows you to uh, design non-linear music experiences. Um, so, for example, in this first example, uh, users could uh, select between different scenes that they could uh, go back and forth um, between, and uh, they could also use their voice to participate in the music. Um, the second example here in the middle is um, was designed for a specific location, so people could walk around in that location and the music would adapt their, to their spatial location. Um, and the third one just came out, I think I haven't had the chance to uh, test it yet uh, because I only have an Android phone. And it, I think as far as I know, um, it uses video recognition um, mainly, I think, to make the music uh, dynamic, I guess. So. What are limitations of, the, of these few examples um, is uh, that, they, that such apps are commonly uh, custom made for an artist in a very specific musical context. Um, and they usually have, um, I, that's my assumption, I think they don't use um, analytical capabilities that we have today to analyze music automatically and then recompile the music based on that. Um, and very often they are actually uh, based on generative content, so um, it's not necessarily, they have, they do also have audio content, I guess, often, but uh, what has been taken advantage more of more is um, synthesizers and MIDI capabilities, I guess. Um, and they're very often platform specific, and that's also one of the problems we address um, in this project. So what we came up with is uh, what we call the semantic music player. Um, which is a, um, an application that is based uniquely on web technologies. So it uses the web audio API. I'm, I'm going to show you later uh, quickly what, what technologies are behind it. But it is basically a platform, a completely platform independent app uh, that you can uh, either have as a browser app, but you can also compile it into a mobile app for, uh, to be a native app for any of the mobile platforms we have today. So iOS, Android, and Windows phones, and, and so on. So what this allows you to do is design dynamic music um, experiences, and it mainly, uh, that is mainly based on semantic web technologies. And um, you can design an experience, and the interface adjusts uh, um, dynamically to whatever experience you uh, design. So it, for example, allocates the sensors that are needed. It um, provides you with the certain user interface controls that are needed for your case. Um, so yes, I'm going to show you how this works. So um, we have, we, this player supports all the kinds of sensors that are um, available on mobile phones, um, I guess, so far, uh, but also allows you to, oh, sorry, <laughs> trying to go back, but I think it takes some time. So um, also some user interface, uh, a variety of user interface controls and automatic controls that can just be plugged together 
um, and then kind of linked to the music, I guess. Um, and it also uses analytical information, uh, so features extracted from the music to inform um, the way you play back music, basically. So the whole framework that we're developing also uses kind of some other uh, softwares. Uh, Dymo Designer um, is a software that allows you to visualize musical feature data, allows you to compile these things into such um, into a format that the player understands. Um, and this format we call dynamic music objects. Um, so you can design these dynamic music objects using the visual software over there and then export them as either a file folder or something like that, or it could also be distributed. Um, it could just be one file that links to many distributed uh, entities across the web. And finally, you can input that into the player and the player then uh, adjusts its interface and, and, um, and allows you to play back. Um, these objects. Yeah, so this is just a little example to show, oops, to show how the distributed situation looks like. So the music objects are basically linked data files that take data for, that link to entities all across the web and maybe also local entities. So you can have feature data on, in one location, you can have musical metadata in another mo uh, location and then audio files at different uh, places. Contextual data about, for example, the weather and uh, other, uh, yeah, contextual things. Um, and all that is then gathered by, by these objects, basically. Okay, here, the technologies we use uh, is, at the core is the Web Audio API, I guess, with uh, um, JavaScript. So we have a JavaScript engine that we wrote on top of the um, Web Audio API. And then we have the designing software over there that uses D3 to visualize things and also AngularJS, I guess, to um, design the interface, and the semantic player itself uh, uses Ionic and um, AngularJS too, so it runs in the, in the browser, but it also runs on any uh, kind of mobile phone as a native application. The demos themselves are either packages of uh, audio files and structural data, or they can be uh, as linked data, I guess, as I, as I said. And how we enable all this is by using what you see in the uh, lower left corner, by using ontologies that allow us to define concepts and to reuse concepts that other people defined and um, get everything together into, um, um, and use them exactly in the context we want to use them, I guess. Yeah. Um, so dynamic music objects themselves are related to our kind of a special case of what the FAST project focuses on. Um, it, which is called digital music object. I think Alo has already uh, mentioned them, um, which are basically encapsulations of audio file with lots of metadata around them. And that's inspired by research objects, which are um, a similar thing used in research and mainly allows, uh, so it's, you publish a paper along with all the data uh, that you analyzed, along with the algorithms that you used for that and so on. So it's basically your entire research project in a little uh, nutshell that, so that people can reproduce it. And, so we try to achieve something similar for music. And dynamic music objects them, themselves specifically are based on a um, hierarchical music representation format called Charm um, that kind of defines music as uh, entities um, or musical uh, structures as made of many little modular entities that have specific types that you can define. And uh, you can define functional relationships bet between all these types. So you can kind of build large hierarchical structures uh, that describe your musical object. Um, so a musical object has sub-objects, and they have sub-objects again, and so on. So here is just a little example of a very simple um, mixing use case. So uh, several uh, channels are mixed together, grouped uh, by a higher level object that if you change that, it changes all the lower level objects, and so on. Uh, what you can also do is you can define relations between objects, between objects like that. So, for example, similarity relations to describe how these objects relate to each other and so on. Each of the objects can have features and they can also have parameters. Okay, I don't have that much time left, so I'll, I'll go over to a demo, I guess. That's also um, one of the main parts of my presentation. But quickly, you can take analytical information and uh, parameters, musical parameters that you define. You can define low-level parameters and then define higher-level parameters based on those lower-level le parameters and define the functional relationships between them. Um, 
and then you can also take features into account and those features uh, which you take from feature analysis, so, uh, from music analysis software that um, outputs them, you can um, use these features to inform the functions uh, or you can use them in the functions you define. So I'm gonna go to, this is a good example of how you can define that. So uh, on the bottom line we see we have two parameters that are kind of standard low level parameters and then we define these green boxes here are higher level parameters that we define in relationship to features um, that we have available. So we define, for example, tempo as something dependent on the duration of each little sub uh, note of uh, or sub object of a general object, and then um, um, map that to time search ratio. And yeah, <laughs> so it's a little. I don't have enough time to explain this, unfortunately. Uh, the, <laughs> okay, I think so. The Dymo designer can be used to uh, create all this in kind of an intuitive way, so that you don't have to define the functions yourself. You have all sorts of tools available. You can just uh, use them and draw things um, so that it's available. So, uh, quickly a demo. So this example here uh, is quite similar to the one I just showed, which was probably too short for too sh uh, too short of a time for you to see what's going on. But basically, you have uh, two tracks, and you can crossfade between them. They are automatically beat matched, um, and you can, um, they are um, beat matched. Oops, let me see. And you can also change the structure of, of, the, of the songs themselves. So you can change the number of beats per bar. I'm just gonna start playing. Not sure. Okay, oh, whoops. Okay. It is out of words. So this is the first song, now the fader is on the left side. And so what this does is it crossfades uh, the tempo of the two songs, basically, it linearly interpolates into the tempo, and um, also crossfades the amplitude, I guess. It's, it's very simple. But, so now it starts changing the tempo and crossfades into the other song. The other song is slower, so now it's slower. And then we can change the meter, so now we are in triple meter. And then you can fade back. <coughs> so now we have both songs in triple meter. And, you know, we can also change other musical characteristics such as. Uh, so now we can kind of filter it. Shuffling. So it's yeah, we can really, uh, change the musical structure. But these two things stay aligned because uh, we defined it to be so. Um, a few other examples. Um, here's an example of how we can. Uh, define higher level, um, oh, I guess it's not really legible for you. Um, so we have three parameters, one is called rhythmicality, one, another one is called space and another weirdness, and those are all high, higher level semantic parameters that you define by defining relationships to lower level parameters, and those can be quite complex. So here we have just a musical example that we can play back. Right now we have zero rhythmicality, and if we move this, we get more and more rhythmical elements, I guess. And then we can enhance the space. Go back to the less rhythmical things and then, yeah, and um, alter the weirdness around. So, it's just an example of what, whoops. Okay. Um, yes, and I think my time is almost up. Uh, it is up. <laughs> so uh, you can come talk to me and I can show you the other use cases. Unfortunately, I didn't have t uh, time to show uh, all the other applications that we have uh, used this project for. But we basically used it in several sub-projects uh, now of the FAST project. Um, yes, okay. I guess that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, you said that you did beat matching in mm -hmm. your application, uh, but uh, okay, do you detect the beats and then time stretching? If yes, how? Exactly. Web so, technologies? 
Can you specify? Yeah, so we, uh, all we use in this project now is, are the plugins that we developed at Queen Mary, so the BAM plugins that you can use to extract features, and one of them extracts beats. Um, so it tells you where the beats, beat locations are within the piece, and um, we use this information to in, infer, uh, actually the beats don't have to be regular, so we, we try to align the beats and change the duration of each of them to, uh, to, to match up, I guess, yeah. And then time stretch one of the pieces, or each, basically each of the beats of one of the pieces to match the duration of uh, each of the beats of the other piece. But what do you use, do you use to do time stretching? To do time stretching, we use a library that someone uh, developed in JavaScript now. Um, uh, let me see. I think it's in a, uh, it's an adaptation of um, SoundTouch. Yes, exactly. SoundTouch JS we are using for that. Yeah, right now. There is a very interesting uh, paper I think that will be presented here about time stretching. Can't remember the, the name on, on the other. Ah, it's you. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, okay. It will be presented. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so there are still, I, there, there are still some, uh, um, I guess, some improvements that can be done in terms of time stretching. I, I saw one library that is not public right now that is, sounds really, really good um, so far. But <laughs> Other questions? So I just wanted to ask, is it uh, possible to use any audio library or uh, what are the sources of the sound files? Um, you mean for the sound files themselves or for the features, to, uh, to analyze the features or to analyze the sound files? Uh, the sound files, uh, the, the sources uh, themselves. Uh, any file format, yes. Uh, it, well, whatever is available for the, uh, to the web audio API, yeah, I guess. And what, as far as I've tested it, um, I think I've only tested it with MP3s, WAVs, and AAC files, but those are also mutually compatible in this system, so they can be used at the same time, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got one question, because uh, I made some state-of-the-art about m music description ontologies recently, and uh, using the, the LOD search engine and uh, the vocabulary search engine, I can't remember the name exactly, uh, you, uh, some of the ontologies you use are not regi registered. Are not present in these search engines. I was wondering why. Like you talked about the multi-track ontology, I couldn't find it. Oh, uh, that's uh, it. Actually, is an ontology from a long time ago. I think most of these ontologies are compiled on the GitHub repository of uh, of the music ontology itself. I think okay. um, you can find older versions, but I think they are not officially published and. We see that this is a problem. I think we're okay, trying so to address it as soon as possible with all these things. We will have to talk together. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so I, f I think it's we got no more time for this paper. Thanks a lot. So. So the, uh, the next one, you, 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 you stay on the stage, okay, so <laughs> the same guys <laughs> will present uh, about the geolocation adapt adaptive music player, adaptive music player. So just m use my computer for this too. Um, different program. Oops. Okay. Right. So, um, so this uh, talk is going to be about a geolocation adaptive music player. I warn you beforehand. Uh, I don't know much about it. Uh, I will try and do the best I can to represent Alfonso, who unfortunately couldn't be here. And I will um, talk about uh, sort of, I'll introduce it and then talk a little bit about features that are used. And then Florian will show you a nice demo of it, hopefully. Um, so uh, geolocation adaptive music player. The main principle is here that the music is played back uh, depending on the geographical location of the listener. 
and there are two features uh, that are um, controlled by the geolocation. So it's the length of a track uh, uh, that can range from a few seconds to infinite and uh, also automatic transitioning. And it's um, based on, again, um, as is the theme in the FAST project, a, uh, it's um, feature extraction, so music information retrieval, and audio rendering from, through signal processing. And also, you've already heard the term digital music object a couple of times. Maybe you're getting used to it by now. So, um, and it uses web audio API. Um, uh, to present it to the users in a browser environment. Uh, so the digital music objects, I think Florian uh, mentioned, already covered it fairly well. It's, um, but I can repeat, like the way we envision it is, it's, it's, it's basically um, a package of information that uh, provides metadata about an audio track that is not necessarily part of the actual audio file, but it resides uh, on distributed servers on the internet. Um, so the features used in a, uh, a geolocation player, uh, for um, timbre descriptors, there's MFCCs, which uh, are widely used um, in MIR. Uh, to uh, do timbre comparisons. There are also uh, rhythm features, basically onsets and B. Uh, and for uh, melodic uh, salience, chromograms uh, features are used. And then for loudness, uh, we use RMS energy. And then the similarity is calculated based on these features and uh, um, calculated as uh, self-similarity matrices. And then from those self-similarity matrices, a uh, graph is composed um, that uh, enables to transition uh, between sections in the same track or between two tracks. So the features basically are um, the time-based features uh, uh, are based on beat tracking, so finding uh, the beats um, in an audio track. And then for each uh, beat, we calculate the average uh, um, MFCC uh, vectors. So uh, the MFCCs are averaged uh, for each, uh, each beat. And then um, we um, calculate the um, Euclidean distance uh, in relation to the zero vector. So we get basically for each beat uh, one uh, floating point value. Um, and then uh, we do dimension reduction. We end up with a dimension reduction and then we apply the same uh, principle to chroma features. And then we use one uh, other features that are already one dimensional and we get uh, five features in total. For, so each beat will have five uh, feature values for uh, um, one for each of MFCC chroma beat duration, uh, metrical position, and RMS energy. And um, from those, uh, for each we compute self-similarity matrices. And that's what um, a global uh, beat similarity matrix is based on. And then, so this uh, is how we uh, construct the similarity graph that will then determine um, there are um, 
also constraints uh, based on threshold. Uh, and um, also tra the transitions will then depend on uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, thresholds uh, and um, I think yeah. uh, you want to talk about the, how the audio is rendered and yeah, okay. cool. So what we've seen so far is um, how we can kind of reorganize a piece to fit a certain duration because since we're thinking of um, people walking around in a geographical location and um, taking a path that they decide to take, uh, we can't predict how long they are going to stay in a certain area and how long one of the songs will be played. And so in order to adjust the duration of the song, we do exactly what um, Alo described. So we actually jump around in the song based on similarity relationships. So we calculate where are good uh, points to loop certain parts of the song or to, um, to jump to other parts of a song because we have to fast forward. Um, we do that by using a self, these uh, self-similarity matrices. Um, and then what we also do is um, we also try to determine how to transition to the, to the next song that will, is actually in the playlist in the best possible way. And we do this by finding, um, by calculating a cross correlation of the end of the first song that we are still playing and the, the beginning of the, that we hopefully reach via, one, uh, via this graph and the beginning of the next, next song. So we actually align those, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the end of the first song and the beginning of the uh, next song um, and calculate the cross correlation on all those features that we calculated before, which Alo described, um, and then kind of uh, calculate a weighted average or weighted sum, I guess, of all those features uh, where we actually get a curve like this, like. Uh, um, the, the bold curve here, I guess, and we take the maximum point there where there is the highest correlation um, of how these pieces can be aligned um, and select that to be the audio chunk, I guess, in both uh, of the aligned pieces to be uh, where our cross fading has to be performed. So yes, similar to what I uh, said in my talk, we actually try to align um, all the beats of the two songs. We to linearly interpolate the tempo, um, and we also find the best position to do that by um, calculating the cross-correlation. So here is how we uh, crossfade. We actually just use constant power crossfade, and um, as you can see, uh, these the songs in Alfonso's demos are actually acoustic music, so acoustically played music without a click, so they are actually not entirely regular. And you can see this in the fluctuation of uh, these curves here in the beginning, so that's the first song playing. And then we align both songs to, to have kind of constant, um, constant tempo and actually really, uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, quantized beats, I guess. And then we uh, crossfade uh, linearly uh, interpolate to the next tempo, average tempo of the next song, and there, there are the fluctuations again. We allow the song to take its uh, course again um, with the fluctuations, I guess. Yeah, so um, I guess I don't have to say much about how this is to be used. I think it's very similar to what we said uh, about digital music objects in general. Uh, so we try to uh, make a little package um, that can be directly input into a player and the player plays it back. You can do this with, um, so basically first what we do, in the, this is the entire process that we go through to design an experience like that. We first um, manually write the text file of the playlist that we want to play back, then make audio analysis in MATLAB in this case. Um, um, we use a path editor to uh, draw a Google Maps path and then manually align um, the audio files to this path. Um, and in the end, we can play it back uh, when, when the people navigate this path. So yeah, okay, this is the second step. What the consumer then does, um, downloads that data pack and puts it into the player and the player plays it back. So I'm going to show you, we have a working demo online on our Queen Mary server. I guess maybe reload it quick. Again, I think the resolution is not very 
favorable here. Um, so yeah, so it loaded here, that's just for visualizing what's happening, but we have here where my mouse is, we have that similarity graph of the first piece. And uh, as long as the person will be walking along this path, uh, we will extend the piece based, uh, based on predictions. And then at some point we will crossfade into the other piece. And these crossfades I think here are pre-generated, but uh, we can also pr uh, generate them dynamically, I guess. Uh, and then we see the similarity graph of the second piece and, uh, and so on. So if I press play, uh, here we have a simulated uh, version of the walk, so the person will start walking, and we get the beginning of the first song, and the this is Alfonso's band, by the way. <laughs> okay, so... So we hear that most importantly, metrical position is actually, even if we jump around within the song, that's actually uh, maintain, which is really important. We might get lengths, like here we get the same part over and over again. But I think now it goes into the solo part. And the person uh, now here reaches the, um, the transition point. Okay. And now it's transitioning to the next song. Everything is aligned. Yeah, so this song will be played played for much longer. Okay. <laughs> the, just a very simple demo. To conclude, oops, I think I just made a new slide. <laughs> I'm not familiar with Keynote, unfortunately. Okay, here. Um, okay, so yes, basically we showed with this example how uh, you can design something uh, in, in one of these applications on the web using web standards, I guess, too, um, and export it then um, to be imported into everyone's player, I guess. and um, play it back as they're traveling along their path, I guess. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's it, I think. For this. Thank you. <coughs> Any question? Uh, I was wondering about the potential users, or if you have set users, or what kind of users you're looking for, who would be creating these sorts of experiences for audiences? Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, uh, I'm speaking for Alfonso now because uh, I'm representing him. So I think the initial idea for this project was to use it in um, silent discos. Um, so people walking around in the city, and not everyone at the same pace, everyone wear, wearing headphones, and still, even, even though not everyone's walking exactly at the same pace, still keep the music aligned so that people can dance together and have people uh, transition together into a new region and so on. So yeah, it was actually uh, designed for a silent disco use case. But I guess it could be um, applied in many other contexts. You could have uh, just experiences where someone is walking alone and uh, experiencing or investigating in a, a certain environment with musical um, with uh, musical accompaniment or mm -hmm. so we are also thinking about making an application like that where people can design an experience like that uh, online and then gift the, the experience they designed to a person they know and that person uh, can then download it and uh, and and experience what the person designed the other what their friend designed for them I guess so that's one of the applications we're envisioning I 
wondering if you considered <coughs> allowing people to like upload songs while they're out walking around. So it's like, oh, this is interesting to get yeah. from. And then other people who are walking <laughs> feel that same thing. Yeah, of course, uh, it would be great to be able to, be able to do that. I think the current system doesn't support that, but uh, definitely, and that's why we also need fe feature extraction me methods, for example, that can work uh, in real time, basically. So there's new material coming and they have to work in the background and process the data so that it can be ready as soon as possible, I guess. Um, so far, we've only, in this case, even we've produced the features in MATLAB, so it's definitely not possible like that. And even in, in the thing that I showed before, we also use features that we create offline, basically, and store in a big database that. Uh, um, contains all the features for a big uh, music collection, but it would be good to, uh, so yeah, th so there are two solutions. One of the solutions is to extract all the features for a huge, for as much as music, m as much music as possible uh, so that it's accessible for everyone beforehand or have dynamic music extractors in this case. But we'll definitely think about this. It's one of the uh, next steps, I guess. <laughs> um, I was wondering if your if you have any view on how uh, the underlying beat transitions are similar to uh, an earlier existing project, uh, the Infinite Jukebox. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, um, I, I am, yeah. I think they, uh, they are quite similar to that. Um, I'm not entirely certain what kinds of features uh, the Infinite Jukebox uses, but it seems to work very well, actually. And um, I, to be honest, I'm not the main author of this paper, so I don't really know how they relate to each other, but um, and I'm also not sure if it's inspired by the Infinite Jukebox, but um, yes, I, it, it is very closely related. I think the, the, um, the approach that we have is, is uh, for, for this part of the paper is really similar. So uh, just a question. I don't know if I understood, uh, if I have understood it in the right way. You make this transitions only make these transitions or do you loop the, the songs? Yeah, so we actually do both at the same time. <laughs> um, we have, uh, so the songs are basically played back non-linearly by using that graph and jumping around between different positions of the song. Um, and at some point where we decide, or where, where actually the listener decides to leave the area, we notice that um, we have to do a transition soon and then we make sure that we as soon as possible reach through that graph the ending part of the song, which we, or the transitioning part of the song. Uh, yeah, so in this case, we actually do only crossfade the end of the first song uh, into the beginning of the second song. So we leap, we leap to a position where we can do the crossfade, and the crossfade is uh, basically something static. But we also do, with the semantic player now that has kind of reached this stage too, uh, we can do both at the same time. So we can actually have a nonlinear piece and fade into another nonlinear piece. Uh, while not having to, so we can basically generate the transitions dynamically uh, in the moment. I'm just yeah. wondering <laughs> if, if, it, uh, if it could be like a composition, or how do you decide how long, uh, for example, when you loop a song, how long it will take, so it's a, like a kind of a decision that she makes a, a, a kind of composition. Yeah, exactly. I think there is another part of the FAST project that uses something like that. They use prediction algorithms uh, that are much more sophisticated than this that can actually um, already reorganize the whole piece for every position the user is in. And the, the, I, I guess at every position the, the listener is in, they reorganize the piece and find the best way to, um, to, to end the piece and then transition to another piece. And, yeah. uh, so we don't really use uh, prediction algorithms in this yet. Uh, that would be a great idea to do. <laughs> Time for one extra question. Or maybe we go to lunch. <laughs> I have a couple yeah. announcements to make before lunch. Okay, okay. So our, uh, our last paper this morning uh, will be postponed until tomorrow because uh, of a flight mishap. Um, so we get to go to lunch a few minutes early, yay. Uh, but uh, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. First, first, lunch is downstairs. So when you exit, just find the staircase and go down. Lunch will be there. There's also a courtyard outside where you can uh, eat with people.
like because it's a beautiful day here in Atlanta. So get some sunshine and enjoy that. Uh, if you are doing a poster or a demo this afternoon, uh, you're also giving a lightning talk at 2 p.m. in this room for 60 seconds. If you didn't know that already, now you know. And Taka in the back there, um, he's gonna be moderating those lightning talks. So please come back to this room at 1.45 so you can line up in order and everything uh, uh, so we can get through those really quickly. Um, and if you're giving a talk this afternoon during a 2 to 4 p.m. session, the moderator of those is Norbert Schnell in the baseball cap. Um, so also come back around 1.45 so you can talk to Norbert and make sure you're all squared away with that. Um, and also, if you like what you've seen here so far, and you're thinking, hey, how do I host WAC 2017? <laughs> Now's the time to talk to us. Um, find me at lunch. Uh, find anyone else in the committee uh, and talk to us. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about hosting the conference next year. And if no one comes to me, I will start hunting people down. So <laughs> I'd much rather that, uh, that, that, that someone comes to me first. Doesn't uh, hurt. Doesn't. No, it's been a, it's been a great experience. Uh, I've had a great time so far. So uh, enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you all back here at, at, at 2 p.m.
That's fine.
and there's, there's going to be some sound and also countdown timer that cues you. Um, so you can spend for one minute to promote your work, or you can cut it short and just say the most important things for your work. And we give three more minutes to check your emails. Okay, there is a change of plan. Uh, can the presenters of the lightning talk come up uh, and uh, be in line so that the lightning talks goes in lightning order? Yeah, right, right here will be this jammed traffic. Uh, And it is starting in a few seconds. So we have Gerald, Anand, Jason, Andrew Bernstein, Nihar, Ivan, Andre, Tony, Jason Siegel, Michael, Joe Sullivan, Chris Laguna, and John Henry. I think I we have. John, uh, John Henry may or may not present. Yeah. We'll see. All right, let's get started. So I'm sure you've all gone through uh, this moment in your life where you're listening to some music and you think, oh, this, this song is quite nice, but it could use a bit more cover, or the vocals are very loud, or I want more bass. So uh, me and my colleagues at the University of Surrey, we're doing research on source separation, audio source separation, uh, with the aim to tackle these kind of problems. So um, we made this prototype. Um, that does uh, neural networks and uh, web audio signal processing, all in pure JavaScript uh, that you can use to remix uh, existing uh, audio, musical audio content uh, without access to the original instrument tracks. So if you want to find out more, please come to the poster. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Anand. Uh, so this poster uh, showcases uh, Blockly, which is a visual programming framework, which is working with your sketch now. The advantage of having a visual programming paradigm is its ability to captivate users for longer and also engage recreational users in addition. A graphical environment also stresses on logic, uh, which effectively abstracts low-level intricacies related to code, syntax, and semantics. Uh, it features a rich set of block libraries for logic, loops, conditionals, variables, and any other programming concept that you can think about. It also supports the creation of custom blocks, which run our own APIs underneath. Uh, the block-like representations, uh, they can also be saved and retrieved to and from the cloud uh, or our server. It also supports conversion between blocks to Python and JavaScript code, so it'll just spit out Python code or JavaScript code from your block-like representations, which is a great thing to have. and that. It's a snapshot of what the UI looks like, and that's pretty much it. Thank you.
We have a second poster about your sketch in the poster rooms as well. This is, again, a, a computational learning environment where students uh, at the high school level learn about computer science and uh, making music uh, together. And uh, yes, I have 48 seconds left, I see. Oh, you want me to speak into here? OK. So uh, I hope I get the seconds back. So anyway, this poster is about how we uh, uh, originally implemented pitch shifting in the environment, which is like a DAW environment. So pitch shifting is an important thing to have. We used to do it in a really sucky way where we sent audio off to a server, and it rendered the pitch shifting and sent it back to us. And that was horrible for a lot of reasons. Now we do it uh, in the browser using ASM.js and some libraries that we wrote, which are now also open source and out there for anyone else to use as well. So we're going to share that information with you. Uh, and also any advice on how we can continue to improve how we approach pitch shifting and time stretching in the year sketch environment. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm presenting on uh, GenDJS, uh, which is a JavaScript implementation of uh, dynamic stochastic synthesis, which is a technique developed by the composer Ayana Sanakis, um, wherein uh, a predetermined number of breakpoints are randomly placed uh, in a waveform buffer and then uh, linearly, linearly interpolated between these breakpoints. Um, on each cycle through the waveform, uh, they, uh, the position of each breakpoint is updated on the x-axis, which is time, and the y-axis um, in amplitude uh, using a random walk. So over time, uh, the positions of these breakpoints change and the shape of the waveform changes. Um, this was implemented using the script processor node and I have created a uh, small demo page uh, to perform with. Thank you. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Snyder and this is Nihar Matavan. And we, uh, we worked on writing a piece for, we made a piece for performance that involves audience interaction with cell phones and you'll be able to be part of it tomorrow night. Uh, but also we've got a little poster over there and Nihar will describe a little bit what it, how it works. Yeah, so we explored um, four different uh, interaction roles between audience and performers. So we built some instruments for audience members to use with and without performers. And then we also had um, percussionists on stage which use crowdsourced um, beats to play from, and then we used uh, performers which could play music out of the audience members' phones. So we detailed those four interaction roles and have a couple of examples by our poster. Hi. I'm Evan Feenstra. I created beatpush.com, which is a web application using a lot of the web audio nodes, as many as I could fit in there. And I'm going to have a, uh, a demo on it later on, so come check it out. It's got like LFOs and audio or auto harmonization, all kinds of filters. The sequencer is laid out in a circle, well, kind of a square circle, but definitely a ring, which kind of is the cyclical nature of music, right? And you can automate parameters just with one click. So I really designed it to be super intuitive for students and beginners of music production. And I used uh, web components and a framework called Polymer, which is really awesome. It kind of encapsulates all the CSS and JavaScript. And it really has great performance and works well on a phone. So come check it out. Hello, uh, dear colleagues. I'm glad to present the Virtual Sound Gallery, a web stage for multi-channel music and sound art. It is a virtual reality framework for interactive reproduction of spatial audio uh, recordings. Uh, it demonstrates web audio planner node and its uh, binaural synthesis capability. The goal of the project is to provide an accessible environment for composers and sound artists across, across the world uh, to let them share their uh, sonic artworks with wide audience. During the demonstration, I will show the content management system and uh, its features. Uh, thank you. It is a great honor to be a part of this venue. Thanks. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Tony. I'm the author of WebXOX, which is a web audio drum synthesizer and sequencer. Uh, it's uh, kind of paying tribute to the old Roland TR-909 and 808 drum machines, but not really imitating them. So all synthesis is done entirely, all the sounds created entirely through subtractive synth synthesis. There is no use of samples, um, and it has a looping step sequencer uh, similar to the old, uh, the old drum machines as well. Uh, so uh, come check it out during the demos and play around with it, and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Siegel, and later today I'll be demoing Olos, which is a website located at olos.cc. It's an environment to play with music through code and visuals. And I had two goals, uh, lofty goals. First, to create a tinkerable environment where everything, both the music and the source code, can be remixed. Um, second, uh, I wanted to use visualization to promote a deeper understanding of sound and code. And often these goals were at odds with each other, but uh, I've learned a lot through this process uh, using uh, web components. So Olos is built with individual standalone web components. Uh, and within the Olos environment, each component becomes draggable and you can connect its audio nodes to other audio nodes or audio params. Um, in the environment, there are musical constraints, so everything's mapped to a global BPM uh, and scale, and uh, each component has source code that you can edit, uh, and thank you to the open source libraries that made this possible. Hi, uh, okay, the picture is very small, but we're going to play guitar at the demo stand just later on, and uh, if you're into classic rock, the simulated amplifier below sounds with the presets for Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, Deep Purple and so on, and if you are more into high gain metal freak, then the uh, pedal board on the top can chain effects, can uh, chain or put in parallel several instances of the amplifier, and the amplifier has uh, one particularity that is uh, quite rare, it sounds, and it's got no latency. And uh, uh, I saw many different tries uh, uh, that we use just a simple web shaper somewhere with a filter, and this is not enough to make it work. So we modelize the world, st the different stages of an amplifier, split the channel by frequencies and so on. So come to see us. Uh, Schroeder is an electronic piano powered by the Web Audio API that attempts to keep the technology in the instrument as transparent as possible. It consists largely of a Google Chrome bit. Uh, I could talk a lot about the experience of building it, but uh, suffice to say that the hardware part was much more difficult than the software part, which I think is a validation of the web as a platform for the creation of physical musical instruments. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Chris Lagoon. I'm a master's student here, and um, I'm presenting a web app for audio declipping. So my motivation comes from, as you can see in this picture, we all have uh, mobile phones these days, and we like to take audio and video recordings. So the problem is that these mobile phones, microphones aren't always good quality, and we like to take recordings of things in noisy and loud environments, such as a concert like shown here. So we've got all this great video and audio content, but the actual audio in the recordings isn't such good quality. So trying to address this problem here of can we actually post-process the audio to clean it up and improve the listening experience. So uh, we're starting off by just focusing on clipping, and so I um, designed and implemented an algorithm for declipping. So uh, let's chat if you want to hear it and know how it works, or just discuss this problem. Thanks. Not doing his uh, lightning talk, but uh, uh, his demo will be uh, probably presented today, and if not, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, oh, there he is. But yeah. So uh, all the demo and poster presenters also uh, 
please uh, try to be uh, ready setting up uh, your stuff sometime between now uh, around 3 p.m. but no later than 3.30 uh, earlier the better in general. So I'll see you guys upstairs and downstairs. Okay, let me reset. Hey, sorry. Um, I'm John Henry from New World Symphony. And uh, real briefly, um, I'm going to just do a demo on kind of the current state of uh, 360 video and binaural audio streaming. Um, my hope for this uh, conference was to have a iOS app made that would actually stream um, live mic input from the Ricoh Theta camera to a um, uh, to using the EarCam Spatializer that was presented last year uh, at WAC 2015, but I ran into a wall of my JavaScript programming skills, and so I'm going to kind of uh, do a different demo today, um, showing some of the research we've been doing into binaural and 360 video at New World Symphony, as well as um, uh, some stuff that I've recently discovered um, for streaming that I can actually stream live 360 uh, video. So. That's it for the, today's lightning talk. So please, uh, the talk session will begin. Reactive audio, So fancy. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about reactive scheduling with the Web Audio API. Um, this is mostly about marrying the concepts of uh, reactive UI development with the Web Audio API. But this isn't a lightning talk, so first you're going to have to hear about me. Um, I work at HashRocket. I'm a consultant. So a primary concern of mine is always writing code that someone else will be able to understand. And it's very important as a consultant to use um, frameworks that will last and be you know, useful to the next generation of people so we can leave behind good code. Um, our primary audience is the next generation of developers on our project. So lately, we've been really excited, along with most of the JavaScript world, about uh, React.js and reactive UI development um, but this isn't where my interest started. My first experience with programming was Quick Basic, and I wrote a lot of songs, and those songs were sequences of letters, and you'd push play. So uh, when I graduated, unfortunately, um, Quick Basic was no longer a useful skill, and uh, there was no jobs in making music that were available to me, and I ended up learning web programming, but I always wished that I was a music application developer. And then one day, um, music application development came to me. Um, someone built this web audio API thing, and this environment that I know about was something that um, I could write music apps in. And this is my sequencer, which is playing, but I don't hear it. I plug this in. Oh, well. That's a bummer. Um, it makes sound. So, yeah, it's the, the idea here, uh, my performance goals uh, for this thing. Uh, it needs to be trivial and fun to sketch out melodies. Um, I'm interested in polyrhythmic music, so having 
parts that repeat every three beats and parts that repeat every seven and um, synthesizing circadian rhythms. Um, it emphasizes live structural changes by bringing parts in and out and doing, making mutations fun, so um, sort of a live music performance environment. Um, I hope to eventually have some interesting synthesizer capabilities. It sounds like there's some people here that I need to talk to about that. I'm excited to learn more. Um, it needs to be usable offline and also uh, playback on a phone. And um, now, th this is what I'm trying to build. Let's talk about the technologies that I have been using to build it. So you guys are probably familiar as JavaScript developers with React, um, but I'm going to put a big umbrella term around this and say reactive user interface development because React isn't the only thing doing this. Um, React is the biggest one, the biggest name, React.js, but there's also Elm, and then there are uh, some awesome wrappers in the closure script space, um, like Reframe, Reagent, Ohm. So there's lots of tools that do this. But the primary thing that I want to focus on that these tools do is they separate your development experience into the concerns of state and presentation. And then pretty much your entire application development is broken down into the development of functions in these two categories. So you have categories that take your given state, and then they render that state into DOM nodes. So here I have a function in ECMAScript 6 that returns a presentation node given a state argument, right? And you can compose these so all the different parts of your user interface are just these calling these calling these and you hand it a data structure of maps and lists and things and it draws you a beautiful picture and it's one to one so it's super easy to reason about. Um, you can break it down and test just the tiniest little part and then step back and play with the whole big thing and given a state you have one exact visual representation of that state. It's a one-to-one -one deterministic function. So that's great, now you've drawn this picture of state, but things change, it's a program, it's, the whole point is that your state will change, you will hopefully enable users to change your state. So how do you handle that? Um, that's the second category of functions here, and if you use ohm or uh, reagent, then you wind up with um, these function signatures that take a state, the prior state of your app, and then the event that just occurred. And it's your job to return the new state of your app. So it's another small, concise, deterministic function. Well, that's cool. So I want to use this favorite way to program of mine to make music. So this is what I want. You give me state, and I'll play you music. Just, it's another kind of rendering. Sometimes you render DOM nodes, sometimes you render sound. So uh, how do we get there? Uh, let's talk about the difficulties of precise scheduling with the Web Audio API. Um, there's a blog post that I read when I first got started on this project called A Tale of Two Clocks that anybody in here that's tried to do things strictly timed has probably seen. Um, there is a sliding buffer that you end up implementing and you have a set timeout uh, or set interval that comes back and sees if your buffer needs to be filled. The reason you have to do this is you can't rely on set interval or set timeout to actually trigger your audio event. Those things jitter by lots of milliseconds. They're on the same stack as the regular old JavaScript one-threaded virtual machine. So you'll get called whenever the page gets around to it. Um, however, the web audio clock uh, is connected to some serious hardware and is precise. So what you end up doing is using this crappy clock to watch the serious clock to see when you need to do work. I stole this meaningless graph from his blog post. Um, so let's talk about the characteristics of this buffer filling callback mechanism. I'm calling it that because you basically you end up with a function that you winds up being called and says, hey, give me the sound events from this time to this time. And then you provide those sound events. So it sounds good enough. Um, there won't be uh, much stuttering, um, but you have these, and it's conceptually simple. And that's, those are the, the pros there. Um, this is probably too much to try to talk about now, but basically this is me in ClojureScript wiring up a side effect where whenever you change the state of your app, I push that new state of your app into a channel, and here I'm reading off that channel, and when the time constants at the top tell me to, I'm rendering the next bit of your app. Um, it ends up calling this function. This is my callback. Whenever it's time to fill it up, uh, you get your channel, when you started, um, when you're going from and to. So that's the size of your window. 
that you need to fill. And I recently heard about Tone.js, which would probably make some of this a lot simpler. Um, yeah, so what are the cons of this sliding callback uh, mechanism? It's not actually very reactive, so you wind up, uh, if I add a new note or delete a note, it may or may not take effect right away. I have um, these constants. There are a number of seconds in, in the case of my app to get it to perform well. Um, these are set to like 200 milliseconds. So within like half a second, I may just have no effect uh, whatsoever on the sound that I'm hearing. I can add a note and not even hear it for half a second which is a bummer. Um, it's not very performant. You've got this thing constantly pulling. I sit here at about 50% CPU usage um, all the time, even just to play back stuff. And these are, uh, buffering constants are arbitrary. On a fast computer, they could be like tighter, and you could get a more reactive experience. On a phone, they need to be longer. Um, and you don't really have any way of knowing what to tune them to. Uh, I guess you could write a self-tuning doodad, but that sounds hard. So how does React do this? Um, React only does changes to your DOM when it needs to, and it only does them at the last possible minute when you changed your state. Um, and it's optimized to the magic of diffing. So you have your prior state of your DOM and your new state. It figures out exactly what changes need to be made to transition between the two things. So could this be done in web audio, and how, what would that look like? You could have a virtual audio node graph that represented the current state of your audio nodes. And then you could react to changes in your state and present a new potential virtual audio graph. You could reconcile the difference of those. Think about them as keyframes. Um, so how do we get from here? How do we tween from one proposed state of my nodes to the next? And if you could calculate that difference, you could do this as fast as that calculation could occur. As a developer, I only have to think about what's my new audio graph, but underneath, the transitions are handled for me. So if it's such a neat idea, why don't I build it? Because it's really hard, and I'm trying. And if anybody has any ideas or wants to help, um, I would love to talk about it. And uh, here's some credits. There's the seminal article I was talking about. Sequencer 24 is the inspiration for my uh, user interface, and uh, HashRocket pays me to do stuff that's fun sometimes. And Chris talked me into this, and that's it. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> if there is no question right away, can we go back to the music thing and try to make the audio? Oh, sure. Can you check your, your audio, make sure you don't have the headphone out? I will do that. Oh, that's probably what it is. The next speakers, could you get that point? So make sure that the HTML is the audio source. Yeah, that's totally what it was. Thank you. I mean, I can just play with this one. There's a lot of stuff that uh, people have made that sounds, some sounds good, some sounds dumb. Uh, go to sequencer25.com and add your own silly song. Sure, um, so I can go back to some source code where we can talk about, so all of this is implemented. Um, so a data structure comes in and then I place these nodes on the screen and when you press play, um, I push the current frame uh, into a buffer and then I watch to see how much time has gone by. 
Um, and so it is actually right now totally uh, separate from the concerns of the view and the data, and it does react. But I'm primarily interested in how to get rid of any buffer time, because adding a note frustrating. That may not have answered the question at all. <laughs> <laughs> So if we don't have any more questions, we just keep two minutes ahead. Let's thank the speaker as well. Thanks. So the next talk is um, Matthew Wolf. We don't need audio. Backed up by Jesse Ellison from the Center for Communications Technology of Louisiana State. And they will talk about Renotate, the crowdsourcing and gamification of symbolic music and code. Okay. Hello, welcome back after lunch. Um, I'm part of the Experimental Music and Digital Media program there at LSU. And we teamed up with uh, Music Cognition Lab, run by Dan Shanahan, um, and have kind of a team of, of folks. Um, David Baker wasn't here to or way able to make it today, but uh, Ben Taylor is running around um, helping out with the conference quite a bit. Um, and then Matthew Wolf here is, is uh, also one of our lead developers. Um, I just want to mention that this is a mu very much a work in progress. Um, we got into this project and found out that uh, there's a ton of potential and a ton of work to get through. So um, we'll be showing a bit of that. Um, so before the two problems, there's basically a recognition that um, symbolic music encoding is really useful. It's useful for uh, musicologists to be able to analyze music and for people to understand what's going on in music, especially large data sets or large sets of, of music. And we don't have enough of it. Um, so then we reach some of the problems about getting symbolic music encoding. Um, MIR is making leaps and bounds, huge strides in being able to create automatically uh, symbolic encoding, but it's not quite there yet. There are a lot of different challenges that are going on, and some are being solved right now, um, and others are, will, will be in the future. But without it, um, it takes a huge amount of effort and a huge amount of time to actually encode non-notated music into, um, into symbolic notation. So uh, another thing is that uh, we have lots and lots of recorded music and a lot of it is not notated, like various performances that, uh, that of specific pieces that change or improvised, um, a lot of folk music and that sort of thing is just not notated and um, it would be very useful. So. And Here's our goals. Yeah, and New Orleans jazz hits close to home with this kind of stuff, with imp improvisational things. So our idea here is we want to create a way to get less commonly notated music, like improvisation, like folk music, in a way that helps musicologists get their work done and allows them to have quantitative data for stuff that does not have quantitative data. And so we want to add data points that musicologists can study. And so our project, Renotate, a crowdsourced and gamified approach to symbolic music encoding. So we thought of this game idea to apply simple little interactions that anyone can do to gather data. So for example, we could just pull out our phone and just tap along with a beat. Anyone can tap with a beat at any concert. Look down at someone's foot, you're certainly tapping, aren't they? So we just get simple little things like that and we can gather data from it. So we have social interactions. We want when someone plays our game, it's quick, it's simple, they had a little bit of fun, they can challenge their friend. Their friend can say how well they did. They could compete against them and the neat thing about we can solve these MIR problems. And so some examples of, of little games that y'all's friends, family, children might have played. Uh, we have draw something, you know, a little, you pull out your phone, you draw a little picture, you send it to your friend, they try and guess. And uh, we have the mechanical Turk over here, the idea of 
simple problems that can be solved by people very quickly. And so the way we do it, we took a note from reCAPTCHA, that's Google's way of sending photos of books that they're having a hard time changing into text, and they get people to read that, type in the text, they take note of what they typed in. Our way of doing it is with simple games. We take note of what BPM they were tapping at, the shape of the line they drew on their phone, other things like that. And so we make, with these data points, a set of music facts that we can then, as a feedback loop, make more challenging games that get more musically complex data points, like what's the melody line of someone singing or what's the rhythm of a drum beat. And so with this crowdsourcing idea, we can get really verified data points with music all ideas. And so just a couple examples of our levels. The first two we have implemented. Uh, tap the beat. You just We play 10 seconds of audio. You tap your beat, and we record it. We give you something back immediately. That's a trial run I did yesterday. Apparently, I'm pretty good, but maybe I'm a little biased. And um, we have find the onset. Type, tap the screen when the singer starts singing or the drums start playing. Now we know when the singer starts playing. That helps us create future games. So some ideas later, identify the outline of a voice, like if it goes like that or simple things like that. Note matching, and this is where the cool stuff comes in. We take the rough idea of what the vocal contour looks like, synthesize it with web audio, tell the user, does this sound of the vocal part? And then with these social interactions, we know who's, who's good and what data points are good. And so web audio provides an amazing opportunity to verify these data points, synthesize them in a computer-based way, and then get the human part of it to verify was the computer guess good. So some examples of our data. On the left, you'll see uh, this is a, actually this was generated a couple days ago. Every single data point that's ever been put in for one of our songs. And y'all can see the points kind of mesh up. You get little pulses, which is good. This shows us the beat pattern of a song. You can see that fourth line gets a little hazy. That's important. It's a tempo change. So now we know that the performer decided to change tempo there. That's good for musicologists. They want to know that kind of stuff. And on the right, you'll see a very quick MATLAB draft that I drew with a couple data points. You can see a very real example of a beat pattern that's generated by real people interactions. We'll also point out parse.com. It's a great cloud-based database. We're using it for this. It's extremely modular, schema list, NoSQL, all that fun stuff. It's just plug and play, drop and go database. Cloud-driven, completely JavaScript. Wow, well, I'm throwing out a lot of uh, buzzwords there. But uh, yeah, you can use it in JavaScript. It'll send back results in JSON format. And it's really great because it allows us to get to business writing these games and have a database that just works. So for y'all out there, parse.com, look into it. It's open source. It's great. Um, going on. So our ideas in the future with this. We want to create social networking interactions to keep our players involved, to keep them coming back, and to verify our own data set. And the ultimate goal, with enough time, we can generate real classical old school five lines and a staff scores and create these with just audio that is really hard to do sometimes with improvisational stuff. We want to be able to make this modular to any genre out there so people in other parts of the world can use this approach for their cultural music, not just New Orleans jazz. That is good, nice to me, but other places. We want our idea to be adaptable for any musicologist out there so that they can just take their studies and apply it. We want to make an open database so that these musicologists can look into us see what data we've collected, and then make real quantitative musical gains with what we've created with the possibilities of web audio and the immediate deployment of the browser. Oh, and also it's fun. There's that too. So it's a little bit of fun. So um, yeah, here's the web link. Um, it's on right now. Tell your friends, come on. Thank you for your data, and uh, thanks.
Thanks. Uh, a question and a comment. First of all, Parse, I, I don't know if you saw the news a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. But, yeah oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> now, okay. now everyone can have it. <laughs> yeah, it's open source, but yeah, they're, they're not yeah. seen it yep. But I also just wanted to know if you could say a few words about the uh, uh, kind of how people have found out about this, aside from you putting the URL up here. Um, kind of how, how much has it spread virally? How many users have you been able to get? Because uh, um, you, know, you don't have the reach of Google or Amazon to be able to get a lot of people in or, or to get them in through you know, using captures or things like that. So, so I'm wondering if you can talk about kind of recruitment a little bit. I, I can respond to this one. So um, right now, our recruitment is the music cognition classes that are being taught. We are forcing them to uh, input data and, and then analyze it, which is useful. Um, some of the idea behind this actually came out of seeing reCAPTCHA, but then also seeing some other results that were happening by people who were making Facebook games, sending those out, and then having, instead of 100 people try things out, they had 80,000 people run through their little quizzes, right? And the quizzes not only gave them <laughs> the responses, but they had also given them all of the background information from every user that had signed into it. And so we gravitated towards the web and making these simple games for the, the exact purpose that we could put it out as an app, <laughs> as a Facebook app, as a whatever, and have these different types of data sets all coming in. So has it gone out yet? We've only got two and a little bit of levels done. Um, we're going to go for a bit more before we get to that. Um, we're hoping eventually to head towards the whole harmonizations and, and all of that, but just keeping them as very simple games and then having many different types to do. Yeah, I was just curious how much emphasis on the, the fun has been done in the research <laughs> and, and, yeah, you know, well, gamifying is, is... Yeah, we have a little score thing at the bottom. <laughs> so we're, we want to, I mean, obviously with projects like these, we want to get the base things down right and get the games down right before we get the scores in and all, or the points in. Like scores can get confused with other words. But like, yeah, we have a score thing. That's just a very basic way to, you know, a placeholder for a real kind of thing. But I mean, in the long run, we're trying to make game type things with sharing with your friends and stuff like that. We have a Trailblazer Award, which did I award? I did get the Trailblazer Award that time. That basically means we don't have any data points for this yet. So, so good on you. You're the standard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I can mention a little about that. We have some plans for them. We kept them very simple so that you could do things like, um, did this melody go up or down and that sort of thing? And then when you send it to your friend, they can listen to it and say, how close were they? Were they good? And then can you do better? And that sort of thing. We'll see. I think this is all trial and error. Um, but yeah, and it's kind of one stage at a time. It's interesting. More questions? And from um, also maybe that sounds like that could have some machine learning anyway at the back end. Yeah, absolutely. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it could. It could definitely work. It's just far, far stretched. But yes, that's a very good idea, and it's a very obvious implement, implementation choice that we're going to get to eventually, just far. One of the things would be um, like pre-analyzing some of the, the chord structures and things and making guesses and then seeing how close we are. You know, whether it sounds good, whether it sounds bad, and have that be part of the game as well. Yeah. And yeah. That, that allows for human verification of this with yeah. web audio synthesis. Then I would have another question. That is, I can't believe that don't, you don't have a synchronization problem. In which way? That, well, some of the, the user input, input is synchronous with the audio they're listening to and stuff. And, uh, well, in some ways, synchronization isn't that big of an issue in that tapping on the screen, it honestly, it, it's with enough data points, synchronization issues kind of go away. With, for example, this, you see those bright dots, they get little fuzzes on their outside. And yeah, that would be an example of your synchronization problems. But with enough sets, we get a good enough idea and you can see with the really bright points on the left that we have a good idea, even with synchronizations, with this crowdsourcing idea. Thank you very much. So, our next speaker in 
this question during the session with Damon Tolstoy. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, um, Damon Holzborny, and today I'm going to talk about Capsule, a modular composition and performance system developed with the Web Audio and Web MIDI APIs. And actually, um, last month I decided to change the name, so um, it's actually called Park. So Park is a modular composition and performance system developed with Web Audio and Web MIDI APIs. So with the Web Audio API, uh, you're able in Park to uh, combine and connect the synths and effects that are built in parts of the tone.js library. And you're also able to build synths from the ground up with the basic tone.js sources, uh, components, and signals building blocks. So if you want, you could actually build a completely modular synthesizer from the ground up. Uh, and you also can, uh, instead of using the Web Audio API, you could use Web MIDI IPA to talk to your favorite MIDI synths or virtual synths. Uh, today I'm not going to demonstrate anything with the Web MIDI API, but most of what I talk about how the system works will, will apply to that as well. So, uh, Park aims to combine the conceptual simplicity of a modular style step sequencer with the algorithmic flexibility of a live coding language. So what I mean by that, with a, by conceptual simplicity, uh, when it, the fact that if you walk up to your typical step sequencer, uh, it's fairly easy to grasp how it will behave based purely on its physical form. And I add to that easy ways to inject variety and randomness into the patterns that you create. And so Park itself is, I would not, is not considered a, a programming language, it's not a live coding language, but perhaps you can consider it live coding adjacent in its uh, application, if not in its actual syntax. So there's a lot more than I could talk about today, but I will just demonstrate a couple of features of Park to give you a general overview of the kinds of things you might be able to do with it. Uh, first, I'll talk about how Park deals with rhythm, and then I want to talk about one of the modifiers. Those are the parts of Park that allow you to uh, add variety and flexibility to your sequences. So. Uh, a basic park score is simply a string of text. It starts with an initializing uh, line that initializes the module and gives it a name, a tempo and other timing info, and a root note and a mode. Now you can have more than one of these modules in a given score, and each of those can have independent information, both the timing and the, uh, 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 the mode information. So following that will be one or more lanes. Lanes are basically your, your instruments. In the case of all the demonstration uh, scores I'm going to give today, I'm using a simple drum sampler that's just playing some 808 samples. So the simplest, basically possible simple, uh, synthesizer we could use. Um, so rhythm in park. Um, uh, the, a track in park is, consists of two parts. A bracketed portion that contains a note or notes that describe the pitch, or in this case, the sample, so that CH stands for closed hat, uh, and then a rhythm portion. And in the rhythm portion, it's a, uh, just a, a sequence of notes and rests, uh, which are commas and periods, respectively. And uh, these notes and rests are then even, evenly distributed over the length of the bar. So here we have one note, so I'm gonna get one tick on the downbeat. So if we add another note, as you might expect, now I get it twice as fast, like meaning half, half notes. If four, I've got quarter notes, basically. Um, since it divides them evenly, any arbitrary number of notes evenly across the bar, that means that polyrhythms uh, are easy to accomplish. Here, I'm playing three notes on the hat in the time of five notes in the, of the rim shot. I don't hear the, whoops, I'm not hearing the rim shot. Oh, so sad. Um, so there we go. Um, so uh, you're also able to repeat notes. So here I have, this is how I generate 16th notes. 
I'm, I'm saying take that note and repeat it um, at, the, at the resolution that I've described. I have described the resolution by here. I'm saying I have a four beat bar with a resolution of four subdivisions. So that gives you your basic four, four, 16th note resolution bar. You could also repeat patterns rather than just single notes. Now you could also get odd timing by using patterns that are a length that is not divisible by your resolution. Here I have five notes in the pattern. So you'll hear as the downbeat comes around that the pattern is going to be shifting as it, as it comes around because it had some leftover notes at the end, an, end of it. You also can have in the note section more than one note here. So here I'm just alternating my closed hi-hat and my open hi-hat. Now this may be a little bit uh, less obvious why you'd want to do this in a drum track, but uh, in a, in a uh, melody track, this is how you create the melody, by putting more than one, one uh, pitch in there. You also could have more than one bar in a pattern, and that could be either in the note section or in the rhythm section, or, or both. So here I have a, uh, a two bar rhythm, but the same sequence of notes. And here I'm doing the opposite. I have a two bar sequence of notes, by the, using the same rhythms. So, it brings me to modifiers. Uh, there are four types of modifiers. The rest modifier allows you to add variety in the rhythm by doing some randomization on whether or not notes happen. Uh, the dynamics affects volume. Shift applies pitch shifting or other parameter control. And the repeat modifier allows you to divide the beat and in, to, to have repeats or multiply the beat in order to have a, a lengthening kind of repeat. And in all of these cases, you have uh, multiple random and non-random ways to, to modify the beat or modify your pattern. Uh, and since there's a lot to talk about here, I'm going to just talk about the simplest one, which is the rest modifier, so you can get an idea how these modifiers work. So uh, the modifiers will appear after the track, um, and they each have their own bracket style. In the case of the rest modifier, the, quote, brackets are the upside down and regular question marks. Inside of that, I have 80, which refers, in this case, on the rest modifier to a percent. So that means I'm going to do something 80%. And the plus means play 80%. So here we have a thing. So 80% of these notes are going to, to play as the pattern goes. You could also think about things the opposite way, if you prefer, with a minus symbol. That Now I have the opposite. 80% of the notes are not going to play. I could combine these by multiplying it. So now I'm alternating 80% uh, chance of playing to 80% chance of not playing. Uh, I also have, you also have the concept of rests in the modifier. So here I basically have do nothing followed by 40% of the time play a note. So every other note will definitely play and every other note has a 40% chance of playing. I could also, you could also have different uh, values to create patterns of sh shifting probabilities. You also can repeat decisions that were made in the past. So the equal, with the equal sign, so here I say play a note 80% of the time and then uh, repeat that, whatever that decision is, repeat it three times. So if you decide to play a note, don't play the, ne uh, play the next three. If you don't play a note, don't play the next three. So you get basically here, we get whole notes or, or quarter note rests. You can also stack these modifiers to get, um, to get more complex sort of modifications. So there's a bunch of stuff I didn't talk about, so, but this is, uh, that, that gives you sort of the idea of how it works. Um, also, if you are interested, the first app uh, that is built using the park system is, uh, is available, and um, it is your basic tweetable drum machine. Here I have. You can make basically all the stuff I talked about and a lot more are available in this system, but it is just a drum machine. Uh, coming later in the month, uh, Ditmas, uh, along with the open sourcing of the park language and all that stuff, or park uh, library. Um, and all that stuff uh, will be uh, at the, this capsulebeta.russellworks.com, which is in the proceedings here. Uh, I'll post that when that's available. Text Zox right now is already available at russellworks.com slash Zox.
Thank you. I think the language that you created is really cool to describe your lyrics. Uh, did you have any inspiration uh, for that language? The, um, well, it's hard to say exactly the, the, for the, the, the actual syntax, is just, um, but I could say that the, the concept in general came from thinking about stuff that actually, stuff I don't have a personal experience with, but I started to be interested in seeing others use it, which is actually not a language at all, but with the hardware. Uh, physical sequencers like the Make Noise, Rene, IntelliJail, Metropolis, cool stuff that comes out of the Monome community. These kind of hardware things where people are taking very simple things, but then making very flexible systems. That's the kind of, those are the kind of the inspirations that sort of sent me in this, this direction. Who does use this for doing exactly work at the moment? Well, uh, it's just getting finished up now, so 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 me. <laughs> so it, like I'm just like I said, the, the the system is just I'm just I'm just working the last of the bugs out. Like I said, the tech socks is available. You can start playing around with it now if you want. Like um, and the but uh, just sort of finishing up the squeezing the last sort of fragility out of it, and in a, in a few weeks, hopefully, I'll post that, and hopefully, I can get more people hammering on it and uh, shaking out even more bugs. <laughs> Apart from posting, what would you do to get people using your system? Well, so Park itself, so like, so TechSox and Ditmus, these are applications built with the system. But actually, this this system is actually built out of two projects at once. Uh, that one that that I realized were one project, and one was just a regular like you know how making you know sequencers that you could use, whether it's on the web or otherwise, and you use a grass, graphic widget. So the library itself could be used to build kind of a bunch of different stuff, including just things that are significantly less geeky than this, which is like strings of knobs or a grid pattern, those kinds of things. And I'll be releasing uh, probably this summer um, uh, first uh, game, like a collaborative, uh, uh, a, a collaborative music making game. Uh, using a, a you know much simpler version that actually uses graphics rather than geeky strings of text and that, that kind of thing. This is Nifty. Um, can you modify the text during playback? Yes. The way the way it, the well the way it works is right right now it has a resolution of one bar. So in other words, and it's partly due to the fact that since timing there is no real idea of a pulse because each track has its own pulse. So I just sort of punted on that for right now and said okay we have a resolution of a bar. Um, so you can basically send it a score and it's just going to execute whatever's happening, like whatever the last thing it was sent. So basically at, at the resolution of one, one bar. And so both TechSox and Ditmus do the, the same way. Te Ditmus is like the, all the features of Park and, and instead of just the drum machine. And it's the same kind of thing. You could edit your score, send it away, the next bar comes around, it's just going to be updating and playing, and playing what's going on. Hey, uh, the language, uh, at least from what I can see, seems to be simple to, to grasp uh, and simple to model with the grammar. So it's not a question, it's a, a suggestion. Uh, you could have a separate documentation or even part of the project. Uh, for example, you can have several users listening to the same session and you have a, gen generic, a, gen a, you have a generator with that language that will create templates to generate patterns, and the people will say, for example, hi or like at the given moment, and that template will be the one mm -hmm. generating. Yeah, yes, and well, d definitely things like that, things that are, to me, a big part of the attraction, in fact, the main attraction of the Web Audio API and Web Media API is, is the web part of it. And so the fact that it makes it you know, easy to do stuff like you're describing that are Somehow, either whether it's the collaborative, audience participation, the, you know, those kinds of things, to me, that's the most exciting thing about the Web Audio API is the, these po possibility for making things that either artists can create together or audiences and, 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 and artists can sort of interact with one another. So, definitely. Any more suggestions? And the Web MIDI portion of it is working so you can control external. Yes, yes, right, yeah, it does work. You can, you could do basically the similar th kinds of things I described, sending MIDI note data and MIDI controller data. So you can control your external sense or, or, or virtual sense. 
I still have to work on the synchroniz synchronization between those two, th but, but separately they work, uh, work fine. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Der nächste Sprecher ist Michael Weidnauer vom Institut für Rundfunktechnik in München. Uh, great, <laughs> and yeah, thank you for the German introduction uh, in Atlanta. Um, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it's it's great to be here. Um, I'm very excited, honestly. Um, I was not at the first web audio conference, but uh, yeah, the web and audio things are. Um, very important things um, also for um, me and my colleague and uh, the company we are working for. We are um, working for the IRT, that is um, the um, R&D Institute of the Public Broadcasters in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And yeah, I will talk about um, the um, BOC.js framework, that's a JavaScript framework for object-based rendering in browsers. Um, Parts of this work have been developed in the, the EU-funded project Orpheus. Um, the project lasts around two and a half years. Um, we are more or less at the beginning. And yeah, the main goal of the project is um, to develop, implement, and validate an end-to-end object-based media chain. Um, we have 10 partners in the project, and uh, yeah, you might know some of them. Um, there are some very well-known companies and institutes from all over Europe. They are dealing with uh, object-based audio or spatial audio and such things. So um, even after the talk this morning, after the great keynote from Frank this morning, some of you might ask, what the hell is object-based audio? Um, so there is maybe a simple answer. Um, so object-based audio is not immersive audio, as it is often equated to. It is rather um, audio plus metadata. Um, I mean, Frank already told about this. I will keep this rather short, but I think to, just to get a better understanding of what object-based audio is, um, we can compare it with the situation today, um, how audio is produced and distributed um, yeah, in, the, in the current broadcast and network, and this is the so-called channel-based approach. Um, so let's say we have different sound sources, um, we are capturing them with microphones, and we are recording signals. These signals um, then go to a kind of post-production step, there's a, whatever EQing, filtering effects are applied, and then there's a mix tone produced. And this mix tone is um, produced for a very specific target format. In this case, it's for a stereo um, target format. Um, and then the assumption is that the user or the audience has a, a speaker set up that is suitable, um, or not just suitable, that is um, exactly the same as is, it is um, intended to. So in this case, this user has a stereo set up. Um, this works very well. But um, if the user has not a stereo setup, but in this case, or in this example, a 5.1 setup, um, it is no more working. No more working as good as it should. Um, so it's, a, yeah, the channel-based approach is, uh, means to make a production for one format, and uh, an adaptation afterwards is only hardly possible. Um, so let's have a look at the object-based workflow. We again, yeah, I think during the capturing, there is not very much change. Recording signals, going to the post-production step. But then, we don't produce a mix down. We are, um, yeah, rather um, combining the audio signals with uh, additional metadata, such as position, gain, semantic information, whatsoever. And this is then a so-called object-based audio scene. This audio scene is then transmitted to um, the audience, and there's a so-called renderer that um, yeah, produces an audio signal that is suitable for yeah, all the um, target devices that are connected to the renderer. So this can be 5.1 stereo, headphones, whatever, and the renderer takes even into account different situations such as yeah, um, misplaced speaker arrangements or um, if the user is uh, walking in the streets. So um, object-based audio is 
format agnostic. It provides um, basically accessibility, so one could very easily um, offer multiple languages or voiceovers with only one production. Um, personalization is a very big um, point here, and interactivity. Okay, just hopefully you got that. Um, now let's come to the BlockJS framework. The reason I, why I'm here, on the right side um, here, you can see uh, a diagram, an overview of um, the classes um, that are implemented in the framework and how they are connected um, to, to each other and with, with, e with each other. Uh, yeah, it's basically a JavaScript framework. It's published under the MIT license on GitHub. Um, it's written in uh, ECMAScript 5 standard and uses very, very many parts and nodes of the Web Audio API. Um, I'm yeah, also using some third-party libs. Um, for the basic concepts and usage, you can see here on the right side of uh, the screen a uh, short code snippet, how to integrate it in your um, HTML page. Um, so you didn't need very much, you only need a, a scene file, and in the scene file there's all the relevant info written and can be read from. Um, yeah, the framework offers basically three options to load and play audio signals. Um, it can be single audio objects that are rather short and that are files. These are then connected with an audio buffer source node via they're loaded with a XML HTTP request. Um, there can be multiple single objects that are grouped, um, same, and these can be um, one or more longer objects with the same duration. Um, these can have any duration and can be represented in a file or a stream. Um, this is then connected with a media element source node, so an audio and video HTML5 element. Um, the currently implemented object descriptors are gain, position, interactive, and active. Um, on this slide, um, just to give you an impression, information is written there. Um, don't want to go into details, just to yeah, show you um, how this looks like. It's, it's uh, following um, the Spotif um, um, format, um, yeah, but this is only for now. Um, some further basic concepts. Um, yeah, time changes. We heard a lot about um, scheduling, synchronization, and um, timing. Um, therefore, we use the Web Audio API clock. Thankfully, it's a, it's a great uh, library that helps us a lot for, for the timing here. Um, there's also a UI manager class um, in the framework that provides some very basic functionality for a two-dimensional user interface. And yeah, as I already said, um, for longer files or streams, um, e.g. For, to, to be used as audio beds, for instance, um, the so-called media controller class should be used. Um, this media controller class um, yeah, uses media buffer source nodes, so basically you can connect an audio or a video HTML5 element um, to, 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 the, to the framework. But the problem here um, we experienced is, um, I'm, I'm guessing not, not just we, is uh, the channel order of uh, the decoded multi-channel streams or files. And that's why we implemented a class that's called channel order test. On the right side, you can see again two code snippets um, how to, to use it. Um, this class helps you to, um, yeah, to detect automatically the order of the decoded model channel tracks. Uh, this is by, done by frequency detection. And yeah, um, therefore, um, some test files um, are provided with different channel numbers. And in each channel, there's an increased sinus tone frequency um, um, just to yeah, help to detect the order of um, the channel um, decoder afterwards. OK, um, a very short demo. Um, where are we? Here we go. Okay, so this is, as I said, a very, very basic user interface. Um, just um, to demonstrate the object-based audio approach itself, um, I've built this demo. Um, just starting. Um, yeah, it is what it is. It's a short musical piece. Um, the user can... 
smooth the listener. The scene can rotate the listener. Can switch between the rendering modes, now it's stereo. This would be then binaural. Yeah, soloing of objects. So this just playing around um, and to, yeah, to give um, the user an impression of, of, of what object based audio is <coughs> basically. Um, I have. Uh, okay, great. It's not working. Anyway, we don't have time. Coming back to the presentation. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Just, just a short one. Um, yeah. Summary. Um, yeah, the BlockJS framework um, has multiple options to load and play audio signals. It offers automatic detection of decoded multi-channel track order. It renders scenes for stereo and binaural. Yeah, and works on more or less all modern browsers um, that support the web audio API. And my plans for the futures are quite some. Um, I will implement um, yeah, um, in a very important standard, the ITUR BS2076. So for those of you that are not familiar with this uh, standard thing, that's the so-called audio definition model that will be, become very important in the future, I hope so. Um, and the representation will be no more Spotify-like, but rather cheese trace and representation. And yeah, once it is available, I will implement the spatial pen node. This will offer much more yeah, features for um, interpolation and uh, positioning uh, things. Yeah, and the streaming cap capabilities should be a bit uh, extended. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the question. Uh, okay. So that's, it's a lot of data, right? To, to uh, load into a browser. Um, at what point do you start to have problems? And you, you do you have plans to deal with uh, ah, okay. the, the type of data, data problems you'll have with so many channels? I see. Okay, I got it. Um, yeah, that's a. Um, so the question was um, whether um, we ever experienced or we think we will experience problems with the amount of data because of um, the potentially um, many channels or many objects or audio signals that have to be um, downloaded, right? Um, yes, that's a very, very common question at the time. And um, there's not like a number or so we, we are targeting at that we say we need this number. It's rather that we are thinking, um, especially for this um, for this uh, browser case, it should be um, yeah, possible to, to make something dynamically that is um, um, scalable. Um, yeah, that just takes into account the computational um, um, capabilities of, uh, of the browser of, or of the device. And um, there are yeah, not, not, not such experiences yet or numbers yet that I can say um, we need at least, I don't know, six objects or 12 or I don't know. And this all depends a little bit on the use case and on the, the piece of content you're transmitting. I hope this answers your question a little bit. Uh, hi, I was just 
just wondering, so you're doing object-based audio rendering, but are you doing any, um, are you doing any uh, processing with that as well, so the ability to uh, send uh, filter information uh, in that message data as well, or is it just uh, playback stuff? Um, so you ask for a personalization? Uh, sort of, so when you, so at the moment, uh, from what I'm understanding, the object based is saying, there's, you know, start and stop times of, of the audio fragments, but do you also send um, sort of a prototype audio graph with that? So you're sending more than just a rendered uh, uh, fragment, you're sending the uh, processing that happens on that fragment when it's recorded. So it's not just a start and stop. It's it's also like um, positioning of the of the pros uh, of, of the objects, of course. I mean, it's like you can make tra tra trajectories or movements of objects, of course, um, and you can basically you, you could. It's not very much implemented yet in this framework, honestly. Um, there many things will will come in the future, but basically you you, you as author could um, just say. Um, the user shall have um, this degrees of freedom for this object or for, for those objects. So this is everything um, possible, and this will hopefully then come with um, the yeah, ADM implementation. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I have something for web developers, and I hope you will find it useful. Currently, there are several MIDI engines available. A real MIDI, like Web MIDI API, NP API, for those browsers uh, who still support it. Also Chrome extension exists. And there are lots of uh, simulated media. On the top of the Google, I found MIDI.js, Timber.js. There is a MIDI keyboard named QWERTY Hancock. And I'm quite sure many of you have your own libraries that would feed into this list. The problem of using all of those libraries is uh, that they all have different APIs, and it's a headache to stick them all together on one website. What we are trying to do is uh, to give a unified interface for all possible media implementation make it available on all browsers, and uh, make developers' life easier. There are three things we have. First, we hide asynchronous calls behind uh, the sequential looking code. 
we can connect different media things as a graph. This is inspired by web audio design. And lots of uh, free stuff. Also, we provide extensibility. You can uh, add your own library with the standard interface so other people using JCZ can plug it in. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you a secret. It is very embarrassing, and hopefully you will not make fun of me, but I find asynchronous programming difficult. Look at this line in the red oval. Do you know what uh, happens inside the computer when you execute this line of code? Well, as an ex-Intel employee, I will tell you, you don't want to know <laughs> what's going inside the computer. <laughs> because uh, <coughs> computer tries to retrieve the variables in a very parallel style. You don't know which one comes from different cache levels first, and very likely the previous statement is still in execution, and very likely the next statement is starting to execute. But let compiler take care about that. We just want to think about it as take x, then you take y, then you do summation, then whatever result you put into z. That is how human brain works. I always envy piano they can uh, think uh, two-threaded. And they also can use feet to press control and uh, shift. But as uh, one of the previous speakers uh, told, we listen music in a linear way. And we want to program music in a linear way. You press the button, you wait, clock, you release the button. That's what you see in the line of code on the bottom. A first statement, you open, you open uh, the MIDI engine. Most likely it's an asynchronous call. Second call, open standard open a default MIDI out that may or may you be asynchronous. We send uh, not on, then we wait some time, then we send not off. Everything looks sequential, though inside, under the hood, there are lots of asynchronous stuff. This is uh, the illustration how we connect different uh, media nodes in one program. Do we have a mouse here? No, we don't. First uh, line, we open default MIDI in. Second line, we open a default MIDI out. Third line, it's an computer keyboard that you can use as MIDI input device unless you have a real MIDI keyboard connected to your computer. I'm sorry, that, that's the fo fourth call. Uh, third call is uh, an HTML piano that appears on the screen. You can use a mouse or touchpad or touch screen to play it. Uh, last uh, node is a delay node. It delays whatever input 
by half second and uh, transposes it one octave up. Then we connect all those guys together and we can play. Anybody here remembers what MIDI signal goes for damper MIDI, uh, for damper pedal off? Uh, I'm surprised somebody remembers, I don't. <laughs> we have lots of free stuff, it was most trivial to implement, but it's quite useful when you program MIDI application. We can uh, either convert from readable form to MIDI form or from MIDI form to readable form. We have lots of modules available. Uh, the first one is HTML uh, virtual MIDI piano, it's mouse and uh, touch screen. Supports style, support uh, a responsive design, so it's ready for your application anytime. We have ASCII keyboard, transfer computer keyboard to MIDI, and we have uh, oscillator based uh, scenes as a fallback if you don't have any better options. We also have a wrappers for third party libraries and there is a slot for your own library. Pre please catch me after this presentation if you are interested. In the summary, GZZ works with Node.js and all major browsers on most of operating systems. It has easy to use API. It's open for extensions. And if I didn't mention before, it's free. Please get it on GitHub or on the website just-soft.net. I want to thank the organizing committee and the Georgia Tech for great opportunity to speak here. And uh, also Chris Wilson, Daniel Van der Meer, and uh, Yuri C. from Ukraine, who worked a lot with me online, but unfortunately I never met them in person. Hopefully on WAC 3 next year I will see them all leave. Thank you very much. Any questions? Well, if I get your question, if I get your question correctly, there are two ways of doing things when you write media application. One thing is you connect things together and when you press K, something plays. This is implemented as connection between different media nodes. And another thing you may want to do is just write the score. Play this node and wait some time, then play another node. Uh, we have both opportunities. Uh, did I answer your question? A 
Okay. Apparently. Any other questions? I'm supposed to ask some questions if any others, but uh, I'm done with MIDI. Oh, somebody. Just that sometimes we use the MIDI time code or MIDI machine code. Does it support that? To, you know, the MIDI time code to be able to send one time from the old machines to, to another one? Uh, you mean the MIDI time message? Well, yeah, there, MIDI. There, there, there is a F something, right? I don't remember the. F something. <laughs> yeah. So you can send any message. Yeah. yeah, or yeah the, if, if you mean uh, if we have timestamps on the yeah, messages. Yeah, timestamps and the way to handle the, the delay and to correct the things. and uh, It's coming in the next version, <laughs> along with uh, MIDI file player and recorder. Great. Thank you very much. German. Christoph Gutandin von Media Codings spricht über nicht audiodiagonal Processing mit dem Web Audio API. Hm. Oh, ah, yeah. ja. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks Norbert. As Norbert already said, the title of my talk is called uh, Non-Audio Signal Processing with the Web Audio API. That's kind of the clunky academical title. Um, it's about what else can we do with the Web Audio API. Is there something different uh, which is not actually audio? And if you follow, want to follow along my talk, um, or go through the slides on your own, you can find them under that link. And yeah, that's a little bit of information about myself. Uh, my name is Christoph Gutandin. I'm based in Berlin. I'm self-employed at Media Codings. That's my own little one-man company. And I developed something called Shuffle Mix. It's a browser-based DJ mixer. And uh, for that DJ mixer, I wanted to have an audio fingerprinting system. And because there was none in JavaScript, I had to port my own. And um, I ported a fingerprinting system from Python which was then the reason why I thought about non-audio signal processing. And uh, because of my unusual last name, I can use it almost everywhere as a username. So you can find me as Chris Gutandin on the Slack channel or on GitHub, NPM, and while almost all other uh, social network out there. OK, that is the agenda. That's what I want to talk about. It's audio fin fingerprinting in general, and then with ORDF print, um, and then the actual um, the main part of my talk, non-audio signal processing. And I have two bonus tracks, but I think I won't have time to go into that in detail. And yeah, audio fingerprinting, I think you all know what it is. It's the process of retrieving a unique value or some unique values of an audio signal, which can then be later used to match uh, audio signals with other audio signals or to query in a database. Um, most popular application which is doing that might be Shazam, but there are, of course, open source implementations like Acoustica D, Audio Print, Echo Print, Panaco, and I guess there will be others, but I don't know of them. And yeah, they all have their advantages, advantages and disadvantages. And at the end of the day, I had to choose one, and uh, I was going with Audio Print. Um, Audio Print is a landmark based fingerprinting service, a uh, fingerprinting system, which means it um, uh, analyzes the frequencies um, and looks in each frequency bin, it looks for peaks. Once it finds one of those peaks, it compares it to its neighbors and then it stores the difference uh, of those peaks. And one of uh, a huge plus for me was that it's used by the Internet Archive, which is one of the audio sources for my DJ mixer, so I haven't, uh, don't have to analyze the files from the Internet Archive again. I can just use uh, the peaks which they've already analyzed. And it's open source in Python. 
um, which unfortunately I can't use on the web, but it's a language which I can understand, so it was easier for me to port it. And yeah, that was uh, kind of the thing which I wanted to do. I ported it uh, mostly line by line, and uh, yeah, at the end I had a working version, but uh, it was very, very slow. It was uh, even slower than the actual audio. So if I wanted to analyze a piece, uh, 10 seconds of music, it took 11 seconds to analyze it. So that was not the result I wanted to have. And so I um, came up with a very simplified um, uh, version of the algorithm which Out of Print is using. And when I was looking at that, to me that looked like audio tasks, even though after you are applying the FFT. Um, you are not in the audio world anymore, and you are uh, left alone with uh, signals. But the tasks you have to do with uh, the signals are more or less audio tasks. And so my goal was to move as much of the computation as I could into an offline audio context and see how that goes. And yeah, that's now the main part of my talk. And I want to start by the first task. It was downsampling. And this can be done very easily with the Web Audio API. Yes might all know, but um, there's a big trade-off because uh, the algorithm for downsampling is not really specified by the API, and so each browser vendor has, uh, has implemented its own algorithm, so you um, end up with slightly different versions if you use downsampling with the Web Audio API, which then produce slightly different fingerprints. If you can live with that, you can uh, use something which looks like that, you are creating an offline audio context. Um, the only number or the only parameter that matters is the frequency, uh, the sample rate, and then you just decode uh, your every buffer with that audio context, and you get an every buffer at the desired sample rate. Down mixing works very well, and it's uh, specified in the API, and it's uh, implemented the same in each browser, so you can safely use it. It's a bit more complicated, it looks like that. You create an offline audio context, um, and then the important part is that you uh, specify the number of channels. It should have the audio buffer lens as uh, the number of samples. Then, of course, the sample rate again. You have to create a buffer source node, assign your buffer to the buffer of the buffer source node, connect it, start it, start rendering, and then you get a promise which resolves to the uh, down mix audio buffer. But um, there's a bug in Chrome, for example, you have to use an audio buffer which is already at the desired sample rate. You can't use a, a buffer which has a different sample rate. It should be downsampled, but it doesn't work in Chrome right now. Applying the FFT was the next task, and this is very sad. <laughs> it does not work. Uh, a lot of people tried it, and you can search on Stack Overflow for that. Um, there are many, many uh, threads about it, and the short answer is it just does not work because the analyzer node is designed for real time, and um, it will give you the results of whatever buffer it, has, uh, it currently has. And in the offline audio context, you have no way to control which buffer it currently has. So you can do something like that. It looks OK, but it just won't work. So forget it. <laughs> but uh, applying the FFT um, was still an important part in my code. And uh, I uh, used an FFT library at the beginning, which was, which was very slow. And I came across the Web Audio FFT performance test by Chimney, and um, it kind of compares different FFT libraries, and you can see their performance under different uh, circumstances. And for me, uh, that increased my performance by 400%, so that made me very happy. And yeah, the next task on my list was to find the maximum in uh, the signal. And finding the maximum is not really an audio task, so there's no audio node uh, which can do that natively. But there's the script processor node, and I thought I could do it with the script processor node. But uh, after some testing and uh, weird errors, I came across a bug which exists in Chrome, Opera, and Safari, which means the, uh, the on-audio process event is not called on every buffer. So if your offline audio context gets large enough, you can uh, almost be sure that there will be missing uh, on-audio process events. So unfortunately, you can't use it. Applying a gate, I thought that's a task for the Dynamics Compressor node, but it's not supported yet. There's a thread uh, going on in the uh, specification if uh, it could be used for a gate too, but right now you can only use it for compressing, uh, not as an expander. And so I thought I could use the script processor node again, but yeah, as I already said, on audio process is not called in every event. And 
Even worse, the script processor node doesn't have any output in all browsers, which very surprised me. But yeah, you can't use it. Uh, yeah, the last uh, thing is good news. The infinite impulse response filter is finally implemented in Chrome and Opera, and it works very well. And uh, for me, uh, in my test, uh, tests against my stupid code, it was 10 times faster, so it was very w uh, worth to use it. But unfortunately, you can't r reliably re-implement it because of the broken script processor node, so you have to uh, use it if it's there and implement something totally different if you uh, want to have a solution which works on all browsers. Yeah, so with that, that's already my conclusion. These are the good parts, uh, in my opinion. So uh, if you can use the Web Audio API for computations of arbitrary signals, you have a good chance of uh, uh, resulting in a faster processing time because it's implemented natively and um, yeah, therefore it should run faster. And of course, it's already implemented, so you don't have to do it on your own. That uh, saves you some time. And uh, once the audio worklets will be there, which I don't know when it will happen anywhere, anytime soon, then all the script processor nodes problems are solved because we don't need it anymore. And even better, if suspend remove, uh, <laughs> suspend resume will get implemented in all browsers, you can use the offline audio context kind of like a stream when you um, uh, get data um, in chunks, you can process it as it arrives, suspend the, uh, the context, wait for the next chunk of data, uh, process it, suspend, and so on and so on. And um, something which really surprised me um, is that the Web Audio API can happily handle very large numbers because I think it's just a float, uh, um, float uh, definition, which is the, uh, the reason for that. And yeah, so it should be capable of for many, many different types of signals. Yeah, those are the not so good parts. Uh, the current state is broken because of the script processor node. And as it is already deprecated, I don't think that it will get fixed anymore. So there's no way to uh, reliably polyfill an audio workload um, because the script processor node doesn't work. So that's very bad. And um, no worker support. You can't use the offline audio context in a web worker, which is currently, uh, which is normally no problem. But if you have to re-implement own solutions for audio nodes, nodes which aren't not there yet, you have to shuffle your data back and forth between a worker and the main thread, which is yeah, not so nice to do. I don't know how much time do I have left. One more minute. Okay, so I can just briefly mention the bonus tracks. It's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Web Audio Serial TX, it's a pro uh, project by Substack, uh, which is mainly known for building Browserify, and he used the Web Audio API to output serial data as audio, uh, he created audio data which then uh, was sent to a device and the device interpreted that uh, data as serial data. And another project called Doppler uh, by Daniel Raab, as far as I know, he uh, used the Web Audio API to send out high frequencies, and then uh, he could analyze uh, the movement of the device by that. Yeah, and at the end I felt most of, um, felt almost like that. If don't know if you know that, it's the law of instrument, I guess. And it says, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And for me, that would uh, say, to a developer with the web audio API, everything looks like an audio craft. So I don't know if that was the right uh, direction which I took, but uh, yeah, it was a very interesting journey. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I have two comments, and one is heck of a tutorial. I'd love to have a copy of that. <laughs> and yeah, it's online. Two, you can have it. The second one is uh, almost on your last slide. You said that you can detect motion by um, using ultra ultra high frequencies. Yeah. What motion? Uh, motion of your device. So. This is not a project of mine, so this is the disclaimer. But uh, it works by sending out high frequencies, and if you move the device, the response, so it uses the microphone to record the response. And if you move the device, the response will change. And somehow, magically, you can analyze the movement of the device. <laughs> it works. I don't know how, but it works. <laughs>
Which is audio processing, by the way. Hmm? Which is audio processing, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Nothing bad about... If there's no more questions, I can... Uh, yeah. I was asked to uh, bring up the link for the Slack channel. We have a Slack channel with the web audio group. I don't know how to say that. And if you want to join the Slack channel, you can go through that link and have a chat with us. <laughs> Nothing bad to go early to the demo sessions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. That's it.
sorry we had to cut you off there. Uh, we're just getting ready for the web, con web audio concert. That's live coding in the audiovisual web live in one hour.
This is the web audio conference, first concert. We are live from the Academy of Culture Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. It's currently 7.46 p.m. We're happy to see you early. We start with the studio. This is the only five pieces on current content. The first will be live writing by Mary Martinez. Thank you. 
that was Chris Latina, aka Article Collection, live on SoundCloud. Now we're coming to you live with some Christian Smith. He's an awesome percussionist. I knew him when he was at McGill University in Montreal. This is Bone Alphabet by Brian Ferniel. And that was Chris Latina. Okay, article collection live on SoundCloud. Now we're coming to you live with some Christian Smith. He's an awesome percussionist. I knew him when he was at McGill University in Montreal. This is Bone Alphabet by Brian Fernio. And that was Chris Latina. Okay, article collection live on SoundCloud. Now we're coming to you live with some Christian Smith, who's an awesome percussionist. I knew him when he was at McGill University in Montreal. This is Bone Alphabet by Brian Fernio. And that was Chris Latina, aka Article Collection, live on SoundCloud. Now we're coming to you live with some Christian Smith, who's an awesome percussionist. University of Montreal, this is Bone Alphabet by Brian Fernio. And that was Chris Latina, aka Article Collection, live on SoundCloud. Now we're going to you live with some Christian speakers and awesome at the University of Montreal, this is Bone Alphabet by Brian Fernio. And that was Christina, aka Article Collection, live on SoundCloud. Now we're going to do live with some Christian speakers and awesome percussion. The new at the University of Montreal is his own alphabet by Brian Cardio. We're just a few minutes away now from the live Web Audio 2016 concert. Live coding and the audiovisual web. This is a live broadcast from the Academy of Medicine Theater at the Georgia Tech Center for Music Technology, excuse me, at G the Georgia Institute of Technology. This is a broadcast put on by the Georgia Tech Center for Music Technology webcasting team. And uh, people are filing into the hall at the moment. 
and in just a few minutes we will duck the lights and go live. The first piece on tonight's concert will be Live Writing Shatter with composers Sang Lee, Sang Wan Lee, Mary Martinez, George Essel, and Pan Lee, performed by Mary Martinez on laptop. The following four pieces are all written in 2016, so very recent. Some of them are even going to be improvisations. We have composer and performer Jason Freeman on laptop, then Charles Roberts on laptop, composer and performer, Ben Taylor, and then finally Matt McKegg. Sangwon Lee is a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Michigan. His works lie at the intersection of music and computer science, focusing on collaborative music making, live coding, and interactive music. He seeks to create environments that help people feel connected to music, and he creates new ways to interact with people and machines. Lee received his master's degree in music technology from the Georgia Tech Center for Music Technology. And he's performed in many computer music concerts, including NIME, ICMC, ACM Creativity and Cognition, and of course, the beloved Margaret Guthman New Musical Instrument Competition. First piece will be performed by Mary Martinez. Mary Martinez is a musician, composer, and writer. She is a junior in the Performing Arts Technology Program at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And the much-awaited performance by Jason Freeman. Uh, Jason Freeman is a professor of music in the College of Architecture at Georgia Tech. He's a composer, computer musician, and of course, educator. He uses technology to create collaborative musical experiences in live concert performances and in online musical environments. He utilizes his research in mobile music, dynamic music notation, and network music, and develops new interfaces for collaborative creativity. His music has been presented at major festivals and venues, including the Adrian Arjt Center in Miami, excuse me for that, Carnegie Hall, the Lincoln Center Festival, Transmedial, Sonar, and he's been covered in the New York Times, National Public Radio, and in Wired and Billboard. Dr. Jason Freeman received his BA in music from Yale and his MA and DMA in composition from Columbia University. The music we heard before was a little bit of a mashup between Chris Latina, AKA Article Collection, and the percussionist Christian Smith. Smith was playing Brian Fernie Howe's Bone Alphabet and Article Collection, a.k.a. Chris Latinas, playing uh, Trap Studies. Just a few minutes away now from the start of this concert. Again, the concert is live coding in the audiovisual web, part of the 2016 Web Audio Conference. This is a live broadcast from the Academy of Medicine at the Georgia Institute of Technology. CMT, Georgia Tech Center for Music Technology. 
Georgia Tech Center for Music Technology. Um, uh, we launched in 2008 uh, with the idea of becoming a hub for research uh, in creativity and technology related to music. We looked at some white spaces, where we thought there were white spaces uh, in this area, such as audience participation and robotic musicianship, uh, and world music information retrieval and some sonification. We also had multiple groups interested in mobile uh, development, and that was w even before the iPhone. Uh, I just bought a prop from my office. This was the first maybe audio, uh, web audio uh, device that we worked on, mobile web audio. It's a Nokia N95. I don't know how many people here ever even knew that you can develop audio for it, but we had a musical application for it and from the center. We had a bunch of other applications, actually, when the iPhone uh, store did launch uh, that actually were pretty successful uh, back then. Uh, pretty much our foyer into uh, web audio was there because all of these applications were about uh, manipulating and composing and interacting with uh, web audio. Uh, today we're very excited, just like you, to use all the new standards and uh, protocols and application uh, for web audio. Uh, we are trying to use it in some of the new directions that we are taking. Uh, we have educational technology uh, research direction, uh, digital signal processing, which is much stronger than we had before, uh, acoustics, even though I'm, I'm not sure exactly how we uh, introduce that into uh, web audio, into uh, acoustics, but also uh, body augmentation and prosthetic in music uh, and, uh, and uh, brain analysis, which is a, a new area uh, that we are focusing in. And we are doing it all thanks to uh, many of the people that you met here today. We have, next year we'll have 40 graduate students. We're also going to start a new undergraduate de degree in music technology. Uh, great faculty, great staff uh, that uh, I'm sure you met some of them today. So. Um, just to keep things short and to reiterate, we're very honored to uh, host the second after IRCAM uh, web audio conference and hope that you will enjoy the concert and the next couple of days uh, of programming. Thank you.
That was composed with Jason Freeman. That was the composer Jason Freeman with a composition called Life Live Coding with Ear Sketch. I'm guessing that was an improvisation written by Jason Freeman, and that is his project, Ear Sketch.
Deus.
That was Improvisation with In Gibber by composer Charles Roberts. Charles Roberts is the assistant professor in the School of Interactive Games and Media at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He's a researcher in human-centered computing and digital arts practice. Interesting. He is the lead designer and developer at, of Gibber. It's an open source and creative coding and open source creative coding environment for the browser. He's performed with Gibber throughout the U.S., the U.K., and Asia in experimental performance genre known as live coding.
That was Ben Taylor, The Last Cloud, composed in 2016. Ben, ben Taylor is an in interdisciplinary artist and creative coder who specializes in web art, web audio, and network performance practice. This is Matt McKegg. The piece is entitled Live Looping Electronic Performance with MIDI Hardware. This is a live broadcast from the Academy of Medicine Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you. 